Blog Talk Radio. Scott Nickrens, Music Director at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, and you're listening to The Concert from GardnerMuseum.org. Join me in the museum's tapestry room as we listen to some outstanding live performances you won't hear anywhere else. So this week, for our 16th episode of The Concert, we'll be listening to two pieces for two very different solo instruments, piano and cello. First on the program, cellist Colin Carr will play Bach's fifth cello suite. This is one of six solo suites Bach wrote for the cello. In these pieces, made up of solo melodic lines, harmony still plays a big role. In fact, while you're listening, you may notice your ear filling in notes that aren't actually played, like connecting the dots on a page. In this suite, Bach gives the listener just enough dots to evoke those harmonies while still retaining a melancholy sparseness in the music. It's also interesting to realize that each of the movements of the suite is based on a different style of dance. While Bach probably didn't intend for people to dance to the cello suites, the forms he uses come from this tradition. After the delicacy of the Bach cello suites, the opening of Schubert's A minor piano sonata seems downright bombastic. The first movement shuttles back and forth between declarative chords, like the opening, and longer poetic lines, a familiar hallmark of Schubert's style. This performance is played by pianist Seymour Lipton. Before we get to the rousing finale, let's listen to the solo cello played by Colin Carr. Greetings. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the Cows Context of White Supremacy radio program. Uh, Gusty Renegade in the house. Uh, Introduction, a little different today. I'm trying to uh, work to get music on the program. Uh, It's a little loud. Can't have distractions. Trying to get constructive information on racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works a little loud. You got to experiment. That's what. Uh, hopefully, that'll be the last one of the lessons for today's show. Uh, you got to experiment a little bit. Music is a little loud. I'll have it uh, figured out. Hopefully, in the next show, uh, if not next few shows, have to make some experiments, make some errors. No big deal. Everybody makes errors, and uh, today's show will more than make up for that. I guarantee. Everything goes well on this show. You will not even remember the introduction. Uh, today's show, <clears throat> as always, looking to get out constructive information 
on racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works, uh, also offering suggestions for things people can do, particularly non-white people, what they can do to counter racism, white supremacy, help solve their problems that are created by the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, thank you everybody in the chat room. Uh, Akima, uh, Real Woman, all the rest of the folks in the chat room. I generally am unable to multitask and focus on uh, what's happening in the chat room and uh, devote my attention to the guests. So uh, if I'm not paying attention, it's not because I don't appreciate you all. It's just because uh, I have very limited ability to uh, multitask. So I will try and check in occasionally and see what you all are up to. But thank you all for tuning in, and thanks, everyone, for listening live and to the archives. Uh, please check the uh, blog, racism-notes dot blogspot dot com again racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com uh, also since she's in the uh, chat room I'll plug hers too uh, check Akima's blogspot it is <clears throat> the frisky kitty counter racism scratch post check that out she has film reviews all kinds of good stuff uh, about the system of racism white supremacy also helping me get uh, this week's show together uh, I got to thank back of the bus uh, helped me get the book uh, that today's guest authored uh, check out his blog as well nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com again nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com uh, I'm going to be taking calls today as well. A uh, number if you want to call in for the, today's program is 347-215-6071. Uh, I will be taking calls a little bit later. Hang back. Enjoy the show. Hopefully it will be constructive. Uh, today's guest, um, author uh, of a very uh, informative, interesting book. name of the book is Color Monitors, The Black Face of Technology in America. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, this is Professor Martin Kevorkian. Uh, Professor Kevorkian, are you on the line? I, I, am, I am indeed. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining the show. Um, fabulous book. Um, I don't really do... Uh, a lot of uh, boasting, bragging about other people's work. Um, and I don't really feel this is bragging or boasting. I feel this is just, you know, pointing out, hey, there's a lot of constructive information in this work, and I think non-white people would, want, would learn quite a bit uh, about racism, white supremacy, checking out your work. Uh, before we get into that, could you uh, share, you know, whatever information uh, you think would be uh, helpful for our listeners so they can know a little bit more about you and what it is you do at the University of Texas? Uh, it's, uh, let me see. Uh, what would be uh, yeah, the, the context of the guy who wrote Color Monitors? Um, it, what I do at the University of Texas at Austin is primarily I'm, I'm, I'm an English teacher, and uh, and I take, uh, I teach literature classes primarily. Um, as I'll probably have occasion to say on other, on other occasions, one of the things about academia is there's a great tendency to specialize and just uh, go down to a, a, in a particular channel. Uh, mine actually, strangely enough, is 19th century American literature. Um, so the Color Monitors Project is something that really developed from just things I, I started noticing uh, outside of my ordinary academic endeavors. And then it, you know, as academics do, it became then an avenue of academic inquiry. But uh, uh, I'm not someone who sort of came at this originally as a scholar of popular culture, but really as a, as a scholar of 19th century American culture. Um, but I think perhaps that's one reason that I was um, starting to draw uh, connections between what I was seeing in popular culture and the legacy of slavery as it is so uh, graphically explored in 19th century American literature. So that's sort of a kind of a deep literary background for where this this came from that might not be so evident from the book. Um, but yeah, I, I'm an English teacher. Mostly what I do is I, I, I teach I teach writing. Uh, and uh, my goal in all my classes is, is to help uh, students become better readers, writers, and thinkers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's what I'm, that's my kind of, what I see as my, my mission here at the, at the university. Hmm. Okay. So. Very interesting. And uh, do you have a Ph.D. in English? I, I do. I do. I do have a Ph.D. And uh, 
for that reason, as as you might have imagined, uh, I don't I don't ins I don't insist on being called doctor, but in my particular case, some people derive particular enjoyment from calling me Doctor Kevorkian. So <laughs> anyone if anyone wants to you know go down that path, that's that's just fine with me. So uh, yeah. Well, uh, what what would you uh, prefer that we reference you as here on uh, the context of white supremacy? Uh, really, what whatever you're you know most most comfortable with. Uh, my, my first name is Martin, and that's that's just fine. But you know, if if either you or any of your listeners get like an extra kick out of saying Doctor Gavor, <laughs> that's 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 good. That's good too. <laughs> okay. Um, I do want to highlight, uh, as I said, I, I uh, want this show. One of the goals, one of the main goals, purposes of me doing this show is to uh, hopefully share constructive information uh, with the audience. And uh, from time to time, uh, people discredit me because I'm a non-white person in a system of white supremacy. Uh, well, really, I'll just stop right there. That generally is mm -hmm. enough to discredit me. So I'd like to make a point of noting that many of the guests that I've had on my program are not only white people, they are doctors. So these are allegedly very informed white people uh, who've been on the show, and you can check out what they had to say and see how it compares to what I say. So I might from time to time point out that this person, uh, Mr. Kevorkian, is a doctor, in fact, Ph.D. in English. And uh, I actually don't find that surprising at all as it relates to your work uh, because uh, in studying racism, white supremacy, uh, I have concluded that words are very important. Um, and I don't think particularly the victims of white supremacy, the non-white people, I do not think that they pay enough attention to words and the power that words have. And you being an English a doctor in English, PhD in English, I think uh, has a a profound impact on the book that you have written and uh, the grasp of racism, white supremacy that you present in your book. Um, and actually, uh, before we get into your book, I wanted to ask you a few questions, um, more so pertaining towards the importance of language, but I think it's, it's very closely tied to your book. Um, and I also wanted to make a request. Uh, as I was, uh, I was saying before we uh, went live, you are a very intelligent uh, man. And PhD in English, uh, it would be very helpful. I've noted that uh, a lot of the non-white people, a part of their victimization is uh, we, myself included big time, we have a lot of deficiencies in communication. It would be very helpful if you could uh, make your responses as easy to digest as possible. Um, I try to use the criterion uh, when I speak with people, if you could... Uh, give your answers as though you, you, want, you were talking to a 13-year-old and you wanted them to grasp everything that you're saying so that they overstand uh, and get exactly what you mean. If you could do that, that would be immensely helpful uh, for our listeners. Is that an acceptable request? That is a great request, and that's a, that's a new word for me that I love, overstand. I've got I to gotta put that in my dictionary now. Speaking of the power of words, I mean, right there, it's a word you immediately carries an important concept, right? right uh, the knowledge needs to be out there up front and not hit, not understanding, but overstanding. So. Exactly, exactly. We'll try that. We'll try that. But I'll, I'll just give you a warning that it's, it's notorious among professors that none of us thinks that we use jargon or special language. But if we listen to each other, we realize we all do. But everyone thinks that they're the one exception. Oh, I speak clearly, but all those other professors talk in that professor speak. Um, but, I mean, what you say is, is, is profound about how, again, that's another sort of negative power of language that can happen in the academy. There's a kind of sociological study, um, it's done a while back, uh, called academic discourse, just about the ways uh, that people in privilege can wield power by saying things that are incomprehensible, right? Mm. That, that's a certain way of, of deflecting inquiry or um, just asserting one's superiority, right? If I can say something that you can't understand, then that, you know, that gives me a certain sort of power. Um, so that's a very dangerous uh, sort of thing that professors need to be, be wary of. So uh, even more so than your request for me to you know, try to do that, I would request that you keep me honest to that. <laughs> I, I will definitely uh, stay on my toes about that. Um, would you say that uh, if someone is 
use or speaking in a manner that the listeners uh, struggle to comprehend what is being said? Uh, would you say that that person is mistreating the individuals that they are speaking to if they're speaking in a manner uh, where the listeners cannot quite comprehend what's being said, uh, particularly if it's being done purposely. Yeah, I mean, well, that, that's where I would say, you know, particularly if it's being done purposely. And I'm not sure how common that is. I think it, um, yeah, it, it is. It can be a form of mistreatment. Uh, it can be also, you know, not to excuse it, but it's it's a uh, a defense mechanism. This is something that I saw in graduate school. Uh, where you know students would go into a graduate seminar and they would present a paper and they would a they would speak as quickly as possible and b they would speak in a very dense and hard to understand manner and mm. it was it wasn't that they I felt were deliberately disrespecting the other members of the class but they were terrified of being asked difficult questions after they'd said what they had to say so. Wow. Um, so there's, uh, you know, do you see what I'm saying? It's a certain way of insulating yourself of 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 getting those tough follow-ups. So, uh, wow. yeah, that and that that's a very negative thing. The other thing I will say though, and this is just, um, sometimes it's a function that the person speaking uh, is simply trying to work out or think through something very difficult, and maybe doesn't even know what he or she really wants to say at that moment. I find that all the time in my own attempts to articulate something that. Um, uh, but in those, but in those cases, it's the opposite. It's not about not wanting to be understood. In those cases, you know, I might actually want you or the listener's help to say, you know, could you clarify what do you really mean? Where are you going with that? So, um, a couple of different options there about ways that uh, I think obscurity in language can function. Uh, one is sort of defensively, but the other one is just like uh, what you say. You got to experiment. Sometimes you just kind of think out loud. You're trying something out. Uh, maybe it's going somewhere, but uh, maybe you'll get it something good. Um, you know, what, what's one of the one of the rules or, or things that I live by? You see, you know, you gotta, uh, as you say, and you said earlier, it's just you gotta experiment. You actually have to allow yourself to make some errors. Um, you know, it's one of the kind of scientific laws that the truth arises more readily from error than from nothing. Um, so, in other words, if you stay silent about something uh, and don't risk sort of trying something out, um, you'll never get close to the truth, even if you make, you know, embarrassing mistakes along the way. So. Wow. That, I hope all of the, uh, I think that's an important lesson for everyone, but especially the victims of white supremacy who are listening into the broadcast. I hope you're paying attention to that uh, because in working to replace white supremacy with justice, I guarantee, as I have already demonstrated, you're going to make errors. Uh, and what he just said, errors provide you an opportunity to learn. If you are paying attention, willing to acknowledge, hey, I made an error, you can pick out what you did wrong, make your corrections, and move forward. And really, that's what non-white people got to do a lot of that because this is the system of white supremacy is designed to make non-white people make lots of errors. Um, and also going back to what you said earlier, I can completely relate to being in discussions about racism, white supremacy, where I'm speaking with a white person and they are talking fast and or they are using words that are not defined, are vague, are not clearly articulating what it is that they're talking about. And I would say to all non-white people, if you are in a discussion on racism, white supremacy, you should point that out immediately and let the person know that you're talking to, whether it's a white person or a non-white person, that that is not constructive. And I would say if you're talking to a white person, you should let them know one time you're speaking to me in a manner I'm not really understanding what you said. Uh, and it might be that I'm not, you know, intelligent enough to grasp just, you know, Try and speak to me in a manner where I can really grasp what you're saying and not use so many big words or whatever, but let them know that and let them know that, you know, you suspect this could be intentional to mistreat you. But hopefully that won't be the case here. Uh, and I will point out if, you know, I think you might be uh, getting a little bit uh, beyond our level to uh, to digest. Um, but I want to, uh, one, the book is fabulous. So I want to get to that as quick as possible. But I did want to ask you particularly uh, one thing that I think is helpful in eliminating a lot of the confusion uh, in terms of having uh, 
communication that doesn't really reveal truth uh, in a manner that everyone participating in the conversation can grasp is when people do not use the most accurate word to discuss or describe what it is that they're talking about. Uh, and there are a lot, in my view, there are a lot of um, adverse consequences for not using the most accurate terms to converse and communicate ideas. If you, as a doctor in English, if you could, you know, kind of give me a concise, uh, present your view on why you think it's important, if you do think it's important that people really make an effort to use the most accurate terms when they make an effort to have conversation. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> that's my credo right there, uh, and it's it's like everything else. It's uh, it's easier it's easier said than done, and I think uh, has to be done experimentally and with verification, right? Mm -hmm. With you know, from the from the person with you you're speaking with that uh, the term, in, so to speak, the right word is not always the right word just because it exists in the dictionary as the quote unquote right word, but it's it's the right word because in the context of that conversation, we have agreed to how we're going to use it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'll, I'll just, you know, you know, I mean, that's why I think that uh, sort of the title of your show, in a sense, says it all in, in that regard about effective communication, um, that you've clearly chosen what you feel be the strongest and clearest term for what the problem is, white supremacy, right? But uh, the show doesn't, doesn't, doesn't just say white supremacy. It's the context of white supremacy. What are we going to agree that we're talking about when we talk about white supremacy? Uh, because it's a strong term, but it can mean different things uh, to different people. Um, so um, I, don't know if, I don't know if that's a helpful helpful remark or not. But uh, in other words, the right word always exists in a context of um, agreement about it, about how it's being used. That's that's what I would say. I, I would agree. Um, yeah, everybody kind of has to to be informed about what the words mean, then we can move forward with agreement on that. Or if we disagree, at least we all know yeah. well, this is what this is what we're saying the word means. I do not agree, but at least I know what you mean when you say that word, and I don't agree. I even think that that's helpful mm -hmm. in communication because you still have awareness of what's being uh, discussed. Um, I, this is the last question about language, and then we're going to uh, get cracking on your book. Uh, do you have any, I guess, techniques or suggestions that you would give uh, for how you can uh, combat um, vague uh, conversation or vague communication, how to identify it, and things, suggestions that people can use to try to correct that when they're in discussions about anything. But, you know, I'm always talking about racism, white supremacy. If you have any suggestions for things people can do uh, to help uh, point out when someone is speaking in a vague manner and what they can do to try and get that person to not do that. Yeah, I mean, I think the the best way is to present someone with your own understanding of what you think they just said. In other words, if if I say, you know, if I say something and you say, "Well, I don't understand you." Um there's a certain going to be a certain kind of willfulness on my part to think, "Well, I just said it and then it makes sense." Um, but if you say to me, uh, you know, if you give give back to me, well, I think you just said this. Is that what you mean? Now suddenly I'm going to be more invested in trying to make sure that what you said back actually matches with what I intended. Um, I'm not going to just dismiss it as, oh, I didn't get that. But uh, or I mean, sometimes if, if it just didn't form a picture at all, then that's then that's useful. But um, People, people don't, you know, when, it, when, it, when confronted with actual concrete misunderstanding, people are, le are more likely to want to, to correct the situation. People don't like to be misunderstood. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's a technique also uh, in writing, and it's a technique in discussion. Uh, it's kind of a psychological thing. Um, Carl Rogers uh, came up with this idea of Rogerian argument, which is something I occasionally try to teach my students when they're trying to write persuasively, which is that before you go to refute or respond to someone's argument, you must attempt to accurately summarize what they have just what they have just said. Mm. Um, and 
uh, it's a way of getting people, uh, sort of like, like you said, that we don't have to agree on the terms, but at least I can tell you what you mean by that term, and now I can move forward from that um, and still have a meaningful conversation. So. Hmm. Okay. I like that one. I'm going to try that one out, so I'll try it right now. So your suggestion <laughs> is to restate what the person has said, and that way everyone is still invested in the conversation. You really haven't criticized the person, and they get an opportunity to see if they have accurately conveyed their thoughts, and you can move forward with everybody being on the same page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will a lot of work, that. though. It's a lot of yeah. work, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, counter-racism is a lot of work, so hopefully all the people that are listening that are invested in counter-racism can't be lazy, particularly in uh, communicating about racism, white supremacy. You cannot be lazy. You've got to be on your toes, uh, paying a lot of attention uh, to words. I don't know if uh, people have been paying attention to the whole swine flu thing, but words, power of words popped up again. They changed the name uh, of this illness because of words, at least according to reports I have seen, uh, because people uh, in various areas of the world began slaughtering pigs so that people wouldn't get swine flu, and uh, that's not how the disease is spread, according to the reports that I have seen. Uh, and they said, we're going to change the name of this illness to something else, I don't recall, but it was something other than swine flu, so that people will not make the association that pigs are causing this problem. Again, power of words, <sighs> use accurate terms to talk about, uh, to discuss what it is that you're trying to convey. Um, but we're going to switch gears and move into uh, Color Monitor's fascinating book. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to... Uh, ask your permission, since uh, this is the cow's context of white supremacy, I wanted to ask your permission that uh, I can ask you questions um, pertaining to all nine areas of people activity, uh, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. I uh, just want to make sure I have uh, your permission as we move forward to uh, ask you questions about your book or any of those areas as it relates to the system of white supremacy? Uh, a short answer is yes, and, and thank you for, for answering, uh, asking that. And uh, the slightly longer answer is uh, that yes, and for a professor that's both refreshing and terrifying. <laughs> in, in, in a sense, you know, as I said, it's all about specialization in the academy, which means we don't have to answer questions in all the nine areas, right? So hmm. it's it's a... It's it's something that's uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's bracing and refreshing to be, sort of be addressed as a person in in that full capacity rather than okay well you're an expert in X so okay. right on um, I wanted to ask also because I have I actually have not seen even a picture uh, of you I've got your book and there's no photo of you so I don't really know uh, are you a white person. Uh, I, I am a white person, and uh, again, I mean that's I mean, one of the first things that, you know. I said uh, some, when you asked me that question, well, what what are some kinds for people to understand uh, something about the book? I mean, uh, you know, that's right there. That's one of the operations of whiteness is that you know you introduce yourself as a non-white person, and I did not introduce myself as a white person. So now is the time for me to do that. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, well, you know, I guess that's one of those one of those big terms. Well, what do we mean by by a, a white person? Um, you know, I've, at different historical times and in different contexts, you know, it, it would have meant uh, different things. I mean, you know, if you if you haven't seen a picture of me, uh, um, like sort of the best picture I can give of you is that my father, when he was alive, was mistaken for Doctor Kevorkian. So I guess hmm. uh, kind of a skinny looking Armenian, scary face. Um, and right there is sort of another alternative to you know how I might wish wish to answer that question, which is that I am of Armenian descent, um, and so and there's a history of that ethnicity as you know a question mark you know in whiteness, but that's you know goes back to the early 20th century. Uh, I also mentioned sort of like different places where. Uh, you know, having a different identity means different things. Um, I'll say I was probably, you know, it takes it take, took me a while, uh, you know, growing up as I did to get to the place of, of saying, you know, consciously, right, that I'm a white person. 
right? the, you know, part of whiteness is not having to be aware that you are white or having to acknowledge that you are white. Um, but I, I mean, I think about uh, the context of America versus where uh, my fa you know, where my father's family came from. Uh, he was born in Armenia um, in the early 20th century. Came to the United States uh, around 1920 because there was a genocide taking place in in Turkish Armenia, where there was a government policy of the Ottoman Turks to attempt to eliminate everyone of Armenian descent. Um, so, you know, within that context of where my father was born, you know, the question, are you a white person, was not a meaningful one. It was a question, are you Turkish or are you Armenian? And it's going to be a very dangerous thing, if, you know, if, if you're uh, in that targeted group. Um, I don't know if that's a part of 20th century that uh, history that you know is familiar, but it was a pretty successful uh, the genocide. Uh, the world population of Armenians was reduced by about 50 percent uh, during that period of around around World War One. Um, but then again, you know that's in the past in a very different way than say um, slavery is in the past, because once you know my family makes it to America. Uh, there's a chance for, for a fresh start. So, in other words, the Armenian experience of the question of race or ethnicity, we'll call it, is one where, okay, well, in our, you know, uh, in our very sad past, we came from a place where we were uh, persecuted because of racial identity. And then we came to America and we were okay. And I think for that reason, someone from, of Armenian descent, potentially, I want to, you know, generalize about, you know, Armenians, but might be slower, even slower to acknowledge that America is a place where racism takes place. You know, coming from the background, well, you know, my homeland, Turkey, that was where violent racism was. Here in America, I seem to be okay. Um, so then, it, you know, it requires learning about other people's history in America um, to start to acknowledge, well, what it means to be no longer uh, an Armenian, but white, and having access to the privileges of whiteness. Um, uh, and if, are you familiar with a book called uh, White by Law? Have you heard, mm, heard no. of that book? No, so sir. It's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty interesting book. Um, and uh, I want to get the t t title right. It's White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race. Uh, and I'll just pull it off the shelf here, by, by Ian F. Haney Lopez. Uh, it was published in the 90s, 1996. Um, but what it examines is uh, a history of what are called prerequisite cases for naturalization, uh, a series of Supreme Court cases uh, based on the question of who can become a naturalized citizen of the United States. And uh, as per the Constitution, going back to 1790, um, People who are eligible to become citizens, American citizens, had to be white. Hmm. Uh, so uh, the question is, every time there's a new immigrant group that comes to America, there's a question, are we going to count these people as, as white or not? And it's, it's, I mean, it's a very strange uh, history, but um, you know, there are courses back to, you know, the first one of these uh, was uh, decided 1878. Uh, the Chinese are not white. Mm -hmm. uh, 1880, persons of white and half Native American are not white. Uh, 1889, Hawaiians are not white. Chinese are not white again. Uh, Burmese, Japanese, Chinese. Um, interesting. 1897, at that point, Mexicans were deemed white. Um, where this is sort of all getting to for the history or the story that I'm telling you about my ethnic identity is that um, sort of right before this, this time when around World War I, during World War I, during the genocide when a lot of Ar Armenians were coming to America, um, there was a case prior to this in 1909 uh, in which it was deemed that Armenians were white. Um, but actually when there were more Armenians coming in subsequent to that, the question came up again. It had to be retried in 1925. It had to be retried at various other times. Um, and so, you know, going back to early 20th century, I mean, there were cases or even instances, let's say in California uh, in, in the 20s, there would be neighborhoods where there would be a list of ethnicities, you know, that could 
not buy houses in a certain neighborhood, and it would be, you know, Malaysians, uh, you know, Armenians, uh, Japanese, uh, et cetera, sometimes Jewish, uh, black, Mexican. Uh, Any one class so a, is not white. Yeah, that's right. You know, so there's, it's, uh, in other words, I can tell you, you know, sort of this academic story, what I think, think is important, that um, different ethnicities at different times have or have not been deemed white. But when you ask sort of me, my experience, someone born in 1968, uh, am I white? I have to say yes, because uh, though, though there are certain kinds of history that can impinge on one's experience, but it was not my experience sort of looking back that in any way I was denied the privileges of whiteness. Um, hmm. I think that that's one of the, and I, 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 that's another kind of term that I think is a good you know, we talk about using the accurate term or a useful term. Um, when you start to talk to, to, to white people uh, you know, about what it means to be white, uh, I think privilege is an important term uh, to, get, to get people to acknowledge. Things that, um, that are taken for granted, things that have paved one's way to enjoying a certain sort of lifestyle. Um, in other words, I think you know it's it's very uh, it's a kind of it would be a long process to get someone to to admit to say uh, I'm white and I'm a white supremacist, uh, but uh, you know, a starting point might be acknowledging okay, but you are a beneficiary of the privileges that come from the system of white supremacy, whether or not you're an architect of that system, whether or not you even believe in the sort of idea of supremacy that underwrites that system. Um, there are certain uh, unstated assumptions about how your life is going to be that actually affect how things turn out for you. Uh, and when you reflect upon that, you can see that uh, a history and ongoing presence of, of racism has, has, a, has a hand in that. Wow. I'm just I, talking, talking, talking. But Yes, sir. I uh, was thinking... Um, this is a bad habit out for the non-white people that are listening to the show. Uh, I have a bad habit sometimes of uh, laughing in discussions of racism, white supremacy, when uh, truth is revealed. Um, I just I, It strikes me as humorous sometimes, and that is a bad habit. I'm trying to correct that so that I do not laugh uh, when truth is being revealed uh, about the system of white supremacy. Um, because I should be a little more codified and not laughing. I think that has a non-constructive effect on the communication because people just start looking at me because I'm laughing and, you know, <laughs> affects the speaking. No, I'm, la no, I'm laughing, but, yeah. Yeah, well, and this is this is very serious, so I, yeah, but I'm, I, I'm and just... Again, again, it's although, I mean, there's something cognitive about laughter. I mean, you say it's a bad habit, and, and maybe I'm guilty of it, too, but I... The structure of a joke often comes from making a connection, right? And like something snaps into place, and you, 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 so to speak, when we say we understand something or understand something, we say we get it, and we you say the same thing about the joke. Do you get it? Right. Uh, and I think there's something about that thing that happens in your brain when you like make the connection that is so similar to what happens when something is funny. That that's a it's 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 not. I can see it's, it's, it's a reaction that I tend to have, and I, I don't mean it as disrespectful either. And um, it's maybe even tied to the idea that there is, uh, there can be uh, even hard or sad or tragic truths. There can be a certain kind of satisfaction or even pleasure in discovering them. Oh yeah. Uh, you know that it's happier to know the truth than not to know the truth. So I mean, even with something is very serious, uh, if you so to speak, get the joke. Um, I think it, there's, it's, it, it might be uh, fruitful not to deny that aspect of it, you know, the, the way that it makes you want to laugh. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, system of white supremacy, I got it. It's not funny, but I got it. Joke is yeah. uh, for sure on the non-white people. Uh, and I will share, I was laughing when I asked you, all that started by me asking you if you are a white person. You yeah, 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 and right. And I got to tell a big share. story. Yeah, I could just and say I was, yes. I was thinking, okay, he could be practicing white supremacy now because, you know, this could just been a yes and 
and we move forward. But I have found frequently white people are very informed. Sometimes you want to just let white people talk. They will share all kinds of constructive information, and I have told non-white people this repeatedly. Sometimes just let the white person talk. And not only did he share uh, the book, I wrote it down. I'm going to read this immediately, uh, White by Law, Legal Construction of Race, because other victims of white supremacy have been talking about that whole concept of how whiteness comes up in court cases all the time, and you get to really see a wonderful analysis of what it means to be white and who is deciding what is white. What does that mean? This is a wonderful thing non-white people should be looking at. So I hope all the non-white listeners will get the book, White by Law, Legal Construction of Race. Get that book. Not only did this white person, uh, Dr. Martin Kevorkian, not only does he know about the book, he pulled it off the shelf. <laughs> I mean, and again, this only reinforces what I have been saying all along. White people are way more informed about the system of white supremacy, what it is and how it works, than non-white people way more informed. If you want to learn about racism, white supremacy, talk to white people. They are the experts. You do not want to talk to me. You don't want to talk to any of these other non-white people. You want to get Martin Kevorkian. You want to get Robert Jensen. Just go to, we should all make a field trip to the University of Texas, Austin, hang out with the professors down there. They can teach us all about white supremacy. We'd be much better at countering racism. Um, I wanted to ask also, uh, and this has been fabulous right here, this chunk of the program, in my view. Very constructive, and we haven't even got to the book yet, which is fabulous. Um, do you believe that there is a global system of racism, white supremacy? And I define uh, white supremacy as a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you believe that such a system exists? Yeah, I think it's, I think, yes. Yes, I think its operation is evident. Uh, I, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the context? Uh, you know, the professor always wants wiggle room, right? But, mm. uh, I have, yeah, the strong answer is yes, and uh, but even going back to you know how I talk about it when I talk about people, um, when you use terms like people who are dedicated to abusing, um, suggests to a certain extent a level of consciousness of that abuse that may or may not be present, even if the abuse is taking place. Uh, that, that people. There are people who enjoy that privilege and are dedicated to maintaining their standard of living or their lifestyle uh, while remaining even willfully unaware of what it what the costs are what it what it means for those who are defined outside of that system um, so. mm, but hopefully we can uh, examine that as we move through your book because uh, I think uh, or just I read your book. I think what you present in your book, at least for me, it would be pretty easy to snap this uh, to, excuse me, it would be pretty easy to grab this and uh, say, well, I'm going to use color monitors as exhibit A, that the white people in a system of racism, white supremacy, they are conscious and they enjoy mistreating non-white people. I would grab your book and say, uh -huh. uh, let's start right here and look at this and yeah. see if we yeah. think that color monitors suggest White people are very aware of this, and they enjoy doing this. But, yeah, we'll get to the color monitors. Yeah. And I also wanted yeah. to point out for you and the listeners, uh, this is the ninth show I have done. We are six for six with the white people who've been on this show agreeing white supremacy exists. And the definition I gave, six for six, the non-white people, one for three. Again, white people very informed non-white people not so much which is a part of our victimization i believe the system works to keep non-white people uninformed uh, which is also what i want to touch on with your book um i don't know if the listeners if they have read i know some of them have read your work um i suspect you know many of them probably haven't could you uh i guess share 
why the title of your book is Color Monitors and exactly what you uh, what you wanted to do, what the purpose of this book is. Well, it's it's a uh it's uh, it's a, it used to have a longer title. Uh, it used to be it was going to be called Computers with Color Monitors, um, hmm. and I was just struck with this idea that 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 uh, so often um, you see in popular culture, uh, or I began to notice a pattern in popular culture, uh, particularly in forms of escapist entertainment that people enjoy. Uh, that white people enjoy, uh, that white people love to identify with. Um, you see instances in which, say, in an action movie, there's the white central hero, um, you know, the Bruce Willis character who does all the action. But if ever there's a computer or computer work to be done, that work is tended to by a person of color, um, leaving the hero free to not have that sort of digital age headache but just go blow things up. Uh, shoot the gun, you know, exhibit power, and, and have a have a joyride. Um, so I mean, that gets to the heart of of, of the pleasure that, that that you're talking about, the pleasure of identifying with not having to deal with a computer, uh, and adding to that enjoyment is is the image of the person of color who takes care of that that problem for you. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Joanna Brooks, who uh, uh, actually wrote an excellent book called American, American Lazarus, uh, which is about uh, uh, racial communities in early American literature. But she gave me the idea. She said, no, you're just going to call it Color Monitors. And the point of that title is that um, it's a, it's a, it names the computer, you know, the computer peripheral. Uh, you know, the computer has the color monitor attached to it. Uh, and uh, I'm very much critiquing or trying to examine the way in which actually people of color are imagined as peripheral devices, uh, peripheral to the central story that white people want to tell about themselves to their sort of fairy tales. Um, but it's also uh, a noun and a verb, color monitors. It's a declaration. Uh, in America, in the system of white supremacy, color is a factor that monitors, that monitors people's behavior, that exerts power. Um, people are monitored for their color. Uh, people are assigned to different sorts of roles, different positions um, with respect to, to power uh, and prestige um, according to whether they are white or non-white. Um, and that uh, what this book tries to account for is looking at that, the question of uh, whiteness and its privilege with respect to the question of who does undesirable uh, computer work, um, or even more uh, specifically, who is imagined or who is fantasized to be doing uh, the undesirable computer work in the digital age. Mm, wow. Um, wow. Even to the extent where non-white people begin to be identified uh, with the machine, and I, I should say, the way that I learned to say that uh, was from reading initially reading Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. That's sort of the mm. the, fount, the fountainhead for me is uh, you know the the scene at, at Liberty Paints, uh, which is this factory that that actually what it produces is white paint. Yes, yeah, that's, uh, right. that's right. Right. If it's if it's all if, so, it's a it's a giant factory that in Ellison's novel is dedicated to producing white paint. The, if it's optic white, it's the right white, right? It's all about producing whiteness, the technology of producing whiteness. And the main character, Invisible Man, goes and he gets way down into the basement. And there's an old black man there, and he's the one who knows the formula. He's the one who makes the whole factory work. And what he says to the narrator is that we are the machines inside the machine, right? At the, at the sort of the base or the technological core uh, this whole apparatus that reproduces whiteness that goes all out all over the country, that paints the Washington Monument, that, that paints all of those those white house buildings, um, is the black man who is the machine inside that machine. Uh, and my question, based on having read Ellison's novel, I began to discern that same pattern prevalent in the digital age, uh, particularly in popular entertainment from the digital age. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah, I was. I'm going to ask uh, at some point in the show, or maybe you'll volunteer. Uh, when I was reading your book, and it, the name of the show again, folks that are listening, is Context of White Supremacy. That is exactly what he just uh, shared about Ralph Ellison, who is a non-white male. Uh, shared about his work, Invisible Man, which is uh, in my top five uh, book that I've read more than once. Um, I didn't even catch the fact that this uh, black dude, victim of white supremacy, is in the basement of this building making white paint. Um, <laughs> making <laughs> He's making white paint. And uh, he gets in a fight with uh, the, char- the main character in the book, who is unnamed, gets in a fight with him. He thinks he's going to replace his job making <laughs> white paint. Uh, in this factory, and they're mistreated by white people while they're in this factory um, by white people. Uh, I didn't even catch the symbolism of all that when I read the book, um, primarily because when I was reading the book, I was not focused on the system of white supremacy. You as a white person read the book, and that's, wow, that sparked you (laughs) to uh, write color monitors. Wow. Uh, I would again illustrate Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., who uh, authored the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, a non-white person, victim of white supremacy, uh, an analysis and a book of suggestions about how to counter racism, white supremacy. First line in his book is, if you do not understand racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works, Everything else you understand will only confuse you. And I will say, just based on that little snippet right there, had I had a framework for racism, white supremacy, that scene would have probably blown me away, these black people being in a basement making white paint where they are mistreated by white people, and they brag about how great this paint is. This is the best white paint in the world, like I would have just been stunned at that scene. I didn't even catch it until uh, Dr. Martin Kevorkian pointed that out, um, which is what I had those type of moments reading your book frequently uh, with the things that you illustrated uh, from different books, different films. Um, I call myself being uh, pretty informed about the symbolism of racism, white supremacy, and the Terminator uh, mythology. And I caught that uh, – we'll get to that later when we get to Terminator. Um, yeah, but as I read your book, I said uh, Martin is uh, way informed about the system of racism, white supremacy. I strongly suspect uh, this is uh, a, a white supremacist, or he could be, because uh, he's very informed, just the information that you uh, put in your book and what you just said. As a white person in the system of white supremacy – uh, would you say you are an admitted racist white supremacist? Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, I think that anyone who's in the, in the system, you know, is. And uh, you know, uh, I would say yes. And uh, with two, you know, my usual footnotes. Like professors with their footnotes. That's the other thing. But um, what is it? I, I I don't. I don't want to say come off as the fact that sort of. Saying yes is, you know, the end of it, right? I mean, I think that there was a kind of an unfortunate thing. I don't know. Depends, it, it, you know, how you look at it. But um, during the Clinton era, right, there's this idea somehow that Bill Clinton could somehow apologize um, for racism, uh, and that's great if it's about acknowledging a history of racism and an ongoing presence of racism. But, um, you know, in, in other words, if it's in the context of, like, say, Alcoholics Anonymous, where you acknowledge that you're a recovering alcoholic and and that it's a continuing process, right? But um, to, to just say that I'm an admitted uh, racist is not about saying, well, and, and then I got better or I know I'm over it now. Uh, I think one of the things that kind of scares me about having written color monitors is that I devoted myself to looking at this particular question, right? So now I'm somewhat sensitive to how issues of race and racism and white privilege play out around the question 
of technology, and I can I can see that sometimes. But the fact that it you know it was hard to figure that out suggests there must be a lot of other blind spots out there. So um, it's a long way of saying you know if you ask someone you know are you you know a member of, the, of white supremacy. Um, I think that idea of understanding how all the system works, it's, it may be, uh, you can understand some fundamentals about it, but it's so multifaceted that um, the answer yes should not be seen to encompass then a total awareness of it. Does that make, does that make sense? Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess I, I guess I guess the, oh, the, here's the other thing, right? Uh, and uh, maybe this is, a, a, I don't know if it's more or less helpful, but this is where, again, I, I like the idea of the context of white supremacy. In other words, if if, uh, if you just saw the, if I saw the statement in print, right? Which statement? Uh, you know, I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This is a bad habit I had. That's This is a, a rhetorical error. It's called putting the cart before the horse, uh, but where I just, I just spoke as though I'd quoted something, but I hadn't quoted it yet. So oh. I was inadvertently speaking backwards. Consider the following statement. If, if I were to see in print a statement that said, I am Martin Kevorkian, and I am a white supremacist, um, I would want to be able to have some context for that, because there are people that say they are white supremacists who are, say, you know, gun-toting believers in the supremacy of the white race, right, that, um, you know, have you know, go to groups that are dedicated to the veneration and and worship of this. And I think it's important, as you say, to, to have that context for that, to understand the people who don't, who aren't identifiable nutcases in that, in that way are also participants in white supremacy. Mm. Uh, so I, I'm thinking about, um, actually, this is uh, some feedback that, uh, that John Singleton got uh, when he made School Days. Um, Spike Lee or Spike Lee? Um, so is, is he based, what, is, what is the one that he was shot on the UCLA campus? I want to say it was John. It was a John Singleton. Higher Learning. Yes, thank you, thank you. Sorry about that. No um, problem. It was Higher Learning, and uh, if I recall correctly, there's a sort of a scene near the end where there is, you know, maybe that's the person I had in mind. There's a kind of a gun toting nut who, who uh, is a white supremacist. Uh, mm. And start shooting people, and it's kind of the, you know the villain of the piece. Mm. Um, and in dis discussion that John Singleton had subsequent um, to making that, um, there's a person in the audience who said, you know, I really liked your movie, and I thought it raised some important issues. Um, but there's a danger in having that person, that image of white supremacy, be the villain. Um, as if that's the problem and not the whole system, right? As if it's the sort of the people that are the people that sort of mainstream can point to as weird or aberrant if they are the, the villains of white supremacy rather than the structure of the whole the whole machine. Mm, I I wholeheartedly agree, and that uh, is one of uh, two major problems that I have seen um, getting non-white people, the victims of white supremacy, to use the most accurate term to discuss issues of racism. In my view, the most accurate term would be we are in a system of white yes. supremacy. The That's problems right. I have seen with non-white people, number one, they immediately make the association uh, like that you illustrated with higher learning, uh, Michael Rappaport's character uh, in neo-Nazi skinhead group uh, running around with a gun, I hate niggers, uh, uh, and they don't make the association, oh, the nice white female that I'm married to and have sexual intercourse with, that person is also participating in the system of white supremacy. And the white people that I play flag, flag football with, they too are white supremacists. And Vanna White, she too could be a white supremacist. Like They don't make that connection that uh, the Klan and neo-Nazi people, yes, they're blatant, but perhaps the people that you should really be worried about are the people that do not do those things who also are participating in the system of white supremacy that you don't even suspect, that never call you nigger, never make any blatant remarks about non-white people, might even have tons of non-white friends, 
might even be in a sexual relationship with a non-white person. These people, too, can and probably are, if they are able, participating in the system of white supremacy. That is one huge error I've seen that non-white people really have a tough time getting over, and I hope this show works to erode that so that more non-white people understand and realize that, hey, you really should be looking at all white people at minimum, looking at them as suspected racists. Um, the other is that non-white people just seem to be very uncomfortable and afraid of using the term white supremacy. And again, you know, it's just, let's use the most accurate term. I think that's much more efficient and effective in uh, communication. Um, and it's efficient would, and effective when it produces that discomfort, right? Oh, for sure. For <laughs> I mean, right, you know, right, you know. Because that is what is... That it, I was just going to say, that's what's producing the discomfort, the system of white supremacy. Please go ahead, sir. No, that's exactly it. That's exactly it, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, I'm not comfortable either. As a victim of white supremacy, I'm far from comfortable. But, you know, here to address why that is and make an effort to correct that. Um, I was curious with this book, uh, two questions, I guess. Number one... Um, if you could share a little bit more in terms of what sparked your interest, you know, to, to do this work, uh, to get involved in writing color monitors, and did you have an intended audience for this book? Like, who did you feel you were writing this book for? Uh, if you could address those two comments. And for the people listening in and in the chat room, yes, I am going to take callers. Uh, give me a couple minutes, and I will open the phone lines. It's 347 Two one five six zero seven one. But if you could get those uh, two questions for me, please, uh, Mr. Kavorkian. Doctor, sorry. Uh, either one, yeah. Uh, so, what sparked me was uh, it's. I can answer asking the question really uh, in, in similar ways. That um, what sparked me was just a, a lifetime of going to movies uh, <laughs> and uh, enjoying movies but then also starting to be suspicious of what are the patterns that I, you know, that perhaps, you know, what are the formulas that are being fed to me that I am then, you know, I, I'm sensibly, what that I'm enjoying. So uh, my intended audience um, are would be people, whether white or non-white, who are, you know, consumers of that kind of popular entertainment uh, with the hope uh, that people will be more reflective about those. Now, I mean, the book... Uh, does go into other areas like like advertising and, and I think that's a lot of a lot of where you could get most of your fuel about um, saying that this is a system that is intentionally designed right uh, a lot of it comes from that but um, you know the, the 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 well for one thing as a professor my hope is that, is that anyone would read the book so I mean mm -hmm. it means a great deal to have you know if anyone's out there who's read the book and thought about it thank you. Um, but uh, people who want to think about um, the way that we consume popular culture, what what is uh, what kind of patterns is that is that system feeding us? And um, I'm trying to think, like you know, what were the primal scenes? What were the movies where I started to notice that something was, so to speak, wrong or off? Um, you know, in terms of noticing, you know, the pattern I see in color monitors of you know, the black computer expert, I, probably the first theater experience I remember seeing that was in the Hunt for Red October. Uh, mm. I would say that that was back in the 80s, mm. um, where there's the, the, there's the black sonar man who is portrayed as having an almost, you know, supernatural ability to hear things, and he's always got his headset on, and he can track, um, you know, the invisible, silent Russian sub that no one else can track. He's got this sort of super capacity to do that. And Eddie he's very peripheral to action, the action. He's not any one of the heroes. Um, and that overlapped for me with other kinds of, of patterns where there's always the central white character and some sorts of sidekicks or ethnic others that help him along his way. So the most general sense of that, uh, where I remember starting reflecting on it, was like the Indiana Jones movies, where there would be a, a young you know, Chinese kid that would, get Indiana to where he needed to go. Right? There's always some sort of uh, temporary dependence on a peripheral character who is literally a vehicle to help the her hero get from point A to point B to get you know, through some obstacle or another. Uh, so that was sort of the general form of it, is the white hero and 
the sidekicks that enable him to be that hero, and how often those are kind of ethnic others. Um, but then the particular kind of critical density starting to come, you know, in the 80s and the 90s around that peripheral figure being the computer expert. Um, so, yeah, it, it came from uh, it came from going to the movies while reading literature. I suppose that's another way to say it. Um, hmm. You know, going to the movies and reading Invisible Man, going to the movies and reading uh, Frederick Douglass, reading Herman Melville, um, uh, people who talk about racism in the 19th century, how, uh, and noticing in the persistence of these patterns, even from the 1850s to the 1980s, that there are certain things that, even if the kinds of technology or the kinds of, of privilege or domination have changed, uh, there's that still that um, that hierarchy of of uh, white supremacy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I, I again just wanted to point this out because you said this is what sparked your work. Um, reading, I guess I'll use your suggestion. I want to restate what you just said to see if this is accurate. Yes. So reading, uh, particularly reading things dealing with racism, white supremacy, and that allows you to be more critical and more aware of picking out racism, white supremacy, when you went to the movies, watched films. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. Oh. Yeah. That that so, that there, you know, that sort of these ideas. Everything I know, I I learn from books. You know, someone doesn't magically become more critical or have more insight. You know, that I'm just another another guy in the movie theater, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Don't have better eyes or better brain, right? But uh, if I learned something from Ralph Ellison before I walk in there, uh, then I'm not necessarily uh, going to be the passive consumer of that in the same way. I, I would add just maybe one more thing about what sparked this is um, deciding to care about a particular facet of culture was important. In other words, I think that there are a lot of people who care deeply about racism, who know way more about it than I do. Uh, who would not notice this if they didn't make a conscious decision to say, okay, what's going on with technology? So I don't know if this is an argument for specialization, but I mean, there's, it seems like there's a number of different kinds of facets of culture that if you start to say, well, what is going on in just this little corner of the system of white supremacy, um, you can start to notice patterns that you would never notice if you say you didn't care about the question of technology. Just as you have to make whiteness and blackness conscious to yourself, I think you, you have to start to see how whiteness and non-whiteness interacts with other subsystems. Mm, very interesting. Very interesting. So, and, and, I, and again, that's maybe that's one thing that's unusual for me uh, as an English professor um, that I think probably, it's not true of the culture as a whole, but there are not a lot of people who teach literature who have made a decision to say care about technological systems. In fact, sometimes being a literature person is about exactly being in flight from, from technological systems. Um, it just so happened that I had a little bit more of a technical uh, background. Um, I actually studied mechanical engineering before I studied literature. So that was another kind of accident of my education that had me seeing different things in those movie theaters than maybe other English professors without a technical background wouldn't be keen into. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I uh, I personally am chomping at the bit for the Matrix. I'm saving that because I know there are okay. callers, uh, okay, non-white people who. Uh, oh no no no! No apologies. Uh, who use the Matrix uh, frequently as their uh, supreme allegory for the system of white supremacy. And uh, I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm going to let them, uh, that'll be the cherry on top of my cake here. Um, but I did want to illustrate, again, uh, language, words and language, uh, just the power of words. And uh, I, I have concluded for myself, um, getting a better understanding of words uh, will enable you to get a better understanding of symbolism and symbols in general because words are symbols. And if you get a better grasp of symbols and symbolism, uh, and uh, I want to break down more for my audience, um, symbols and symbolisms in terms of um, a representation of an idea, 
uh, right? Like uh, letters represent a sound that means something. Um, words that represents an idea. Um, when you get a better understanding of words, just symbolism in general, the, the black people in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man working in a factory that produces white paint, the incredible symbolism of that. Um, I think if the non-white people, if you get a better understanding of language and words, you will get a much better understanding of symbolism. When you get a better grasp of symbolism, racism, white supremacy will be jumping out everywhere because it is just all over the place in films. But when you read Color Monitors, you will see an English Ph.D. professor picking out racism, white supremacy all over the place, and it will be glaring once you realize what you're looking at. Uh, again, Mr. Fuller frequently points out people frequently are looking right at racism, white supremacy, and totally miss it. And a lot of times it's because of the words uh, that people are using and or are not paying attention to that cause them to totally miss the racism, white supremacy that is staring them right in the face. Um, so, I, again, I really feel like you being a, a doctor in English uh, is no coincidence at all uh, and is probably why your book uh, is excellent in pointing out uh, racism, white supremacy. Um, I, oh, sorry, I don't know if you had a comment on that. If not, I had a question I wanted to ask. No, I mean, that's, a very, that's a very generous assessment. I'm very grateful that you, know, you read it with such care. The book with such care. Uh, I think the thing I would, additional thing I would say about, about language, uh, this may seem a little bit abstract, but a lot of the ways that language and symbols um, signify convey meaning is through systems of difference, through systems of contrast. So it's important to understand the meaning of words, uh, but as you said, sometimes it's about the things that aren't said. Uh, well, you know, what's the, what's the opposite or what's the negative? What's the, what's the term, sometimes the unstated term, that is um, bringing into relief the meaning of the thing that is being said? Um, that why did it's it's that this this word is being used, but it's also consciousness sometimes this word and not that other word, right? Why is the other word not being being stated? Um, so that that's the kind of, so it's a linguistic. You know, it sounds like a, a tough trick, but it's attention to the words and it's attention to what the words are being chosen in contrast to. Um, mm. And I think that that that's a way in which it maps on the way culture works itself. In other words. Um, I was thinking about that question about you know how people respond to you know are you white and how white people talk so much about it. I mean there's different kinds of stories that get told about it, but there's a famous essay uh, by Richard Dyer uh, that's called White, and he talks about a documentary uh, which was made uh, in which people were asked this this question, well what does it mean to be white? Um, and one pattern that was detected in that documentary is that people would first stumble with a question, and then sort of uh, there would be this general tendency that they would wander off the topic of whiteness as such and start to talk about black people and stereotypes of black people, that they could only make sense of what it meant to be white by starting to talk about what whiteness wasn't, right? Mm. Um, so I think that, that a lot of times if you want to, you know, think about it's important to find the white, way white supremacy works, but it's the way white supremacy, of course, defines itself in relation to its opposite. But that opposite is not always made explicit, right? It can it can operate without stating that, but it still depends upon it, even when that the underside is not represented. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just say about the, the examples that I that I talk about. In a way, these are almost um, clumsy. Uh, instances of white supremacist culture in that it explicitly gives a representation of both the white dominant hero and the black other um, who serves or supports that heroism. But there, it's also, there are also cultural artifacts of white supremacists where it just gives you the straight white heroism and um, the oppression that makes that possible is actually can be invisible in that representation and it doesn't mean it isn't there in the cultural system. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I point uh I noted uh 
when you made a reference to uh, Richard Dyer. Is that the gentleman's name? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. They, I think it's simply called White. It appeared in a journal called Screen a, a number of years ago. So it was about, it was kind of film studies, but yeah. Yeah, I I noted that when I read your book. And um, yeah, I'm, def- I'm trying to take a look at that as well. And uh, at least for me, I have seen that repeatedly. And it seems to me that in a system of white supremacy, uh, if I'm a white person or a white person, being asked what does it mean to be white and they invariably end up talking about non-white people, I think it could suggest that being white in a system of white supremacy is defined by mistreating non-white people. Um, I don't know if that makes, if you are in agreement with that or uh, how you feel about that, but that seems to pop up frequently where white people being asked to talk about what it means to be white. Robert Jensen, your colleague, University of Texas, I asked him, uh, how did he find out he was white? And after asking repeatedly, he started talking about his family members uh, who he said were racist, uh, were talking about non-white people and talking about them in a bad way, mistreating non-white people. And I thought, wow, okay, this seems to me it could be suggesting that being white means I mistreat people that I classify as not white. Um, does that uh, does that seem logical? As though that could be accurate in a system of white supremacy? No, I, I think I think that is that is, that is accurate. Uh, I mean, it, it reminds me of a uh, a bit in this again in this. It's the white by law book. I'm gonna, I, I was going to quote again, um, but uh, there was a, 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 a I was thinking about really about the Bob Jensen example. Um, there's a. Are you familiar with? Uh, I'm not very familiar with. But it's just mentioned in this book. The the journal called Race Trader, a journal of the new abolition. Yes, the author wrote uh, how the Irish became white. I called him this week. I'm trying to get oh. him on the show. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, no. I mean that's a that's a that's a one of the most striking examples of that kind of white by law process where the, the Irish were not always deemed white. Uh, but uh, it, it one of the things it laid out was some rules uh, to deal with say. Uh, racist comments, um, and this is essentially a suggestion for white people. Um, but among the suggestions, answer an anti-black slur with, "Oh, you probably said that because you think I'm white." Um, mm. uh, in other words, you know, one of the one of the ways that one can be aware of one is white is there are certain things that would be said only when white people are present and when black people are not present. I mean, what would some of those like, things be? <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a that's a good question. I mean, they, they didn't get didn't give it uh, right there. Um, but I, well, we went back to sort of the things. Uh, what if, what if jokes probably uh, would be a, a good example of that. What sort um, of jokes? Racist racist jokes. Uh, you know, I don't uh, I don't tell, but I'm just trying to think of an example that was like that, you know, in my back, you know, like, when did I realize that I was white, um, was being with my father and uh, overhearing some other man tell a joke, uh, and my father saying, well, that's not funny, right, and I didn't really get it and um, uh, at the time, but it's something I sort of realized uh, afterwards, uh, that was an instance where I could see that that man who told that joke was comfortable because he perceived that he was in the company of other members of, of whiteness and white supremacy. Uh, and, you know, even if we didn't think it was funny, uh, he didn't have a fear or second thought about telling that joke. I, I mean, I... Uh, I can tell you what it was about. I, I can remember sure, it now. Yeah. I can remember what, what it was about. This is, I'm trying to situate when this would have been. Um, but this was probably when I was just a young teenager, maybe 14 years old. So let's say it's 1982. Um, and it's a joke that has sort of around it a whole kind of context of, of privilege because it's about, um, it's about a golf course that gets robots as caddies. Have you heard this one? No, sir. No. I'm not okay. white. See, exactly, exactly. So uh, 
they, they have these robots and they're carrying people's golf clubs around the golf course. They're serving, you know, the people who are enjoying their leisure. Uh, but there are complaints uh, because they are, they're these gleaming metal robots. And so they shine in the sun and it distracts the golfers and they're, you know, they're getting uh, annoyed by this. And so what is the decision, right? Uh, the, the robots are then painted black, right? And I don't recall the exact punchline, but it had to do with the fact that, well, that, well once they painted the black, then they, then they were lazy or they became some, you know, less effective uh, as caddies. Um, and so, I mean, I reflect back on that, and, and I didn't think it was funny at the time, and, uh, you know, what was meant by my, you know, father's refusal to say that was funny, was it just it wasn't a funny joke or that he deeply objected to it? Um, but it was a moment that, for whatever reason, stuck out for me. And, and stayed with me as as a uh, as being in that thing that a you know a race trader would say you know be aware that that was said to you because you were you were perceived as a white person. Would it be more accurate to say that they uh, that joke is said to someone uh, when the speaker uh, perceives that I'm talking to someone who is a racist white supremacist and will oh yeah support. okay yeah that's right that's right yeah yeah because. Uh, because you, you, you say things you, you think are going to make people like you or, you know, that you share in common with them. And, and that would be a way of, of cementing, you know, a bond of, you know, white fraternity. Uh, um, Racist white supremacist fraternity. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, um, yeah. Wow. I'm, this is my, I'm going to the phone lines because people, uh, yeah. I guess they've enjoyed the show because they want to ask questions. Um well, I'm just, just I'm even reflecting that, but that maybe is another moment that got me started about thinking technology and blackness, even probably even that. that really helped, right. I was so. thinking the same thing. <laughs> thinking the same thing. Um, wow. Uh, I want to. Uh, I was going to talk about Die Hard, the films. I uh, I really love this book for a lot of reasons, but films. Um, Mr. Josh Wicked and I believe he's going to be calling in. He's a non-white male, and uh, part of what helped me. Uh, begin to analyze the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, Mr. Josh Wickett, he writes or wrote uh, film reviews, picking out racism, white supremacy in different movies. And for me, that was very helpful because I do read, and I was even reading at the time, but, I mean, if you like being lazy, I won't say it's lazy, but, I mean, everybody watch, watches movies. I mean, that's easy, mm -hmm. it's fun, it's entertaining. Uh, and it's, you know, I still do all of those things. I still get enter uh, entertainment and enjoyment in watching films. But now it's even more uh, enriching for me to watch films because I am paying attention to the racism, white supremacy, and it's always there. It doesn't even matter at this point whether I'm watching Pulp Fiction, Monster's Ball, uh, Forrest Gump, Gone with the Wind, Indiana Jones, Terminator, Star Wars, uh, Westworld. It doesn't really matter. Baghdad Cafe, uh, it's always going to be there. So I just pop my feet up. I have my popcorn. I laugh at the jokes, and then I pick out, oh, there was some more racism. There was some more racism. And then I tell other people so they can go watch the films and catch it themselves. Um, and that's the thing I really enjoy, or one of the many things I enjoyed about your book, um, where you consistently pulled in different films and from different eras. Uh, to further evidence these trends of racism, white supremacy. And uh, I haven't seen Die Hard in a long time, but wow, I was uh, stunned when I read your comments on the film Die Hard and how racism plays out there. Uh, hopefully, everyone, all the non-white people who are uh, listening to this show, I hope they will get your book, Color Monitors, The Black Face of Technology in America. Uh, but I really want to get to Terminator before I get to the calls because I uh, – watched Terminator intensely, and uh, I had paid a lot of attention to the racism, white supremacy, and Terminator, and I even missed some of the things that you pointed out in your book. Um, I, when I watched Terminator, uh, particularly the first two, and I see these trends continue even in the TV series, um, the machines being non-white people, and I've told people this, and they said, what? That's crazy. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, they're not even any non-white people in the film. And I said, well, one, that's not true. Uh, two, slow down. Uh, and just, I mean, to me, it's glaring. Uh, number one, 
uh, on the film, whether you're looking at the video or posters for the films, when Arnold Schwarzenegger's in these movies, his name, Schwarzenegger, Terminator. Schwartz mm. means black in German. And his last name being Nager, you've almost got black nigger on the front of this movie every time yeah. it comes out that he's in it. And Holy cow. it's been my experience. White people know this. They are much more informed about language than I am. White people tend to know what Swartz means in German. That's been my experience. Uh, but even if that's not the – but, I mean, that's just on the front. So, I mean, we continue yeah. Yeah. watching the film. The first one, it starts, and you get this future vision of, you know, oh, my gosh, these machines have taken over, and they're killing all the people, blah, blah, blah. And then they flash back to 1984. Things are safe. And Terminator starts, if you just watch the first scene, when it flashes back to 1984, uh, when the machines are arriving, the Terminator and uh, Kyle Reese, when he is arriving, there is a black man in a garbage truck. And it focuses on the garbage truck picking up the dumpster and putting the trash in and just the machine. It's got the gears and the hydraulic pump and all that just focusing on the machine. But it's like, hey, it's 1984. Everything is how it should be. Black people are taking out the trash. The machines are harmless. And then the machines arrive, and it's like, oh, no. (laughs) And when they arrive, I mean, it's glaring when you understand what you're looking at. The Terminator arrives to kill the white woman. I mean, that is the constant yeah. threat in the system of white supremacy. Yes. He's coming to, and he savagely murders two white women immediately when he gets here. I mean, standing over them, firing like six shots, bang, 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 uh, into the white woman, just like, oh, my gosh. Uh, and John, Con- I mean, J.C., he's coming to stop J.C., who's supposed to save the world. Uh, I was just like, oh, man, this is slam dunk here. I mean, Terminator is, you only need to watch Terminator to get white supremacy. It's right there. And this is like blockbuster. I think the second one is like one of the highest grossing films of all time at the box office. Um, That's my view. If you could share what you shared uh, in your book with the listeners about what you see in Terminator. um, Yeah, and then I'll go to calls, we can chat about whatever, and hope we'll get to the Matrix because that's really cool. But yeah, if you could share what you see in Terminator and what you wrote in your book. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I just just was actually inspired about what you were saying about that idea of the proper relation to technology that and the proper place to speak of black people is exemplified in those guys picking up the garbage in the dumpster. I mean, that is profound. I had not noticed that. And I'll just say just briefly, maybe we want to talk about it, but that same motif comes up in a very weird way at the beginning of iRobot uh, with Will mm. Smith, right? Um What's the beginning of iRobot? Well, uh, it's yeah, I was I actually was inspired to go back and, and, and look by this by, by looking at some uh, someone who had who had blogged about the laws of robotics. But um, oh, he's coming so, on the show. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. He's well, yeah. well, uh, but share, well, share. Okay. well, he's a genius. But uh, but uh, <laughs> that was it. That can you just uh, well, we should let him say it. But uh, uh, yeah, that should be read into the record. What he did with the three laws of robotics is just. He's coming through, and he's a non-white person. Okay, well, uh, but uh, very strange, very strange movie. I mean, part of it, I think it's it throws you off a little bit with Will Smith the main character. But he's walking down the street, and it's 2035. It's decidedly not 1984. And they cast Will Smith as someone who hates robots, and they play it very heavily that it's like a racial prejudice on his part. They refer to it as a prejudice. He says, "I don't like their kind." all these sorts of things um, that oddly portray uh, Will Smith as if he has a racist attitude towards robots. But what he sees walking down the street is he sees a robot walking a bunch of dogs, uh, and he gives that robot a hard look, and he sees robots picking up the trash, Hmm. and giving giving really resentful looks to this. Um, And there's almost like the perception that, you know, uh, the robots have taken the black people's jobs, right? Or what, mm. what you know, right? You know that that these are the things that that. Um, but what, whatever the case is, that that he he deeply resents this, and it's it's odd because then you think it's going to be about 
oh, well, he's going to come to have, it's going to be a kind of a liberal trajectory where he'll come to be tolerant and understanding of robots. And there's a little bit of that, but the bizarre thing about the movie is that he sort of turns out to be right in his deep distrust of the robots, because in fact there is then a slave rebellion. It sort of plays the whole thing through, uh, that the, ro the robots, that, that they were in an inappropriate relationship to technology, that the robots do rise up against their masters, uh, and it comes to an apocalypse, and, and Will Smith basically gets to say, see, I told you so. Um, it somehow destabilizes it that, you know, to put, you know, the heroic black man in the center of that. Um, but now he, he, nevertheless, as the action hero who is articulating this fear of robots who have been explicitly figured as being sort of replacements for black people. Um, I don't know. Wow. I, I need to think more about this movie, but it's it's very strange. Very strange movie. Wow. I... <laughs> I uh, when I watch films, and hopefully everybody that's listening, when you watch movies, I have not been wrong thus far. Every time that I have done this, it has played out. Even if I've had to watch the film a few times, which is fine, because most of the time the films are you know entertaining enough, I can do so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you watch the films, if there are clearly identifiable white people, as is the case in Terminator, Robot, The Matrix, anything that is not human you should just go ahead and suspect that those are non-white people. Uh, anything that is not human, that has been personified in any way, just go ahead and say that, okay, these are going to be the non-white people in the film and see if the relationship plays out that way between the clearly identifiable people, white people, and the non-people in the film. I have found this works from Terminator, iRobot, all the way to Winnie the Pooh. If you watch Winnie the Pooh, with all the animals being non-white people and Christopher Robbins being the white, the clearly identifiable white person, same relationship. Uh, it just it plays in every single film uh, with iRobot specifically. Um, I also noted between Will Smith and uh, I don't know her name, but the white female who works uh, in the uh, robotics company. Um, yeah. You don't get the romantic relationship That's between those right. two. That does not happen because that would certainly not be appropriate, uh, even though Will Smith is playing uh, the yeah. quote-unquote lead hero white role. Uh, he's still a non-white person. He can't really have the love interest that I just kind of assume would be there in the normal Hollywood film. You would get the love interest there. Yeah. Uh, you get it in yeah. Terminator. You get it in The Matrix. You don't get it in I. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to just make it seem like I'm, you know, going to make a case against Will Smith, but it's in Hancock too, right? Have oh, I seen haven't Hancock? seen Hancock. Dang, I haven't seen that. Hancock. I mean, the whole the whole resolution of the plot is that Hancock, the black superhero, has to get away from the white woman, otherwise they're both going to die. Wow. And the white woman goes back and has her lovely domestic relationship with her white husband. You know, there could have been a thing with with Will Smith and this other woman, but literally. Like, they're going to die, and it's going to be the end of the world if they stay together. But So he has to just get as far away from her as possible, and that's the end of the story. Wow. So, and that so happens it's, in... Yeah, and the, the, you, so you got, you know, up on the, you know, up on the, you know, marquee, it's, you know, Will Smith and Charlize Theron. Do you think it's going to be resolved with the, you know, romantic consummation of those two? No, I, right? It's about, the whole trajectory is to take them as far apart as possible. Yeah. Wow. That yeah. that plays out in I Am Legend as well, where mm -hmm. he has to Will Smith has to sacrifice himself to save the white people from the non whites. I again watch that film, the so called zombies, they're non white people. And I am legend, you'll see it real clean in that if you watch the earlier version, which is uh, Omega Man with uh the who's my man? He was a white gentleman, president of the NRA. He recently passed away. Yes, he's the main character, not Will Smith. If you watch Omega Man, it's real blatant uh, what's going on in that film. And there's a non-white female that he has a sexual relationship with in the film. He ends up killing her, but uh, um, yeah, it plays out real easy if you go back and watch Omega Man and then watch I Am Legend. The same thing with uh, with Will Smith. Um, and you talk about uh, his other film. Uh, Independence Day uh, in your oh, right. 
book as well and how uh, you see a lot of the same symbols there. And, and I don't even think he gets off there. He's still mistreated because they play his character. He's the non-white male in a sexual relationship with a, stri- a stripper uh, who has a child by someone else. So he's, you know, the black people are still being mistreated there and how they're uh, represented in this film. But uh, turn back to Terminator. Um, could yeah. you share a little bit more about, uh, I guess, what you see in the second film or, or the first film? Uh, and then uh, I'll go to the phone lines, I promise. Well, it's it's it, it's all focused to, to me most dramatically on the Joe Morton character, as, as you see. You know, the, the people who say, "Well, you know, there's not a black man. You know, there aren't any black people in the movie." Well, yeah, there's this very highly instrumentalized black man who, on the one hand, it gets blamed for bringing this computer technology into the world. Uh, on the other hand, he doesn't get credit for it because really it's just because you know the Terminator came from the future. Uh, and so he didn't do anything creative to uh, bring this high-level robotics. But the uh, the whole association of technology and the threat that it poses to the planet is focused on this Miles Dyson character played by, uh, by Joe Morton. Uh, and therefore, he must be sacrificed. Uh, he has to, to sort of, you know, die for the sins of technology. Uh, in order for the white mother to be happily reunited with her white son. I mean, to me, that's sort of the, there, if there are just sort of two poles of this thing, it's, it's not just the white woman uh, and the black man, but it's the white woman in conjunction with the young white man. It's the white maternal figure is at maximum distance from the black technological man. Like it's, it's like uh, whiteness is their figure is absolute pure nature, uh, and then blackness is on the other side of this, this divide as, as techno- technology and death. Uh, the mother, the life giver, the, the blackness as, as being aligned with, with death and the destruction of the world. Uh, wow. Uh, and uh, so many images of, of just the way it's shot um, at, uh, at Cyberdyne. Uh, is where you know you see where, where Miles Dyson is doing his work on the robotics, and uh, one of the last things he does is he, he files away this little microchip that he's been working on, and he shuts a door on the camera, and the whole screen goes black. And there's the idea that he is making, he's bringing on a black planet, blackened by the threat of technology. Mm. But that's the sort of the eternal. Apocalyptic night is this rise of technological blackness that's going to take over everything. Um, but as you say, most dramatically figured in the Terminator with the assault on the, on the white woman uh, who has to defend mankind for the good of her son. Wow. Uh, I, as I did, again, wanted to point out, um, I have watched, uh, I've even watched the television show because I see it play out there too, but I've watched these films uh, repeatedly and I saw john connor's character in terminator 2 he has on a public enemy t-shirt and i noted that and i was like okay that means something i'm not making the connection and you in your book pointed out the connection and i was just like oh my gosh i can't believe i missed that could you uh share that tidbit uh right right i mean the the big the biggest hit there is 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 fear of a black planet and that is the story of the terminator the story of the terminator is the fear of a black planet that is what jc is coming to save us from save us from the fear of a black planet. Uh, wow. Yeah. So I, I it just want I just want to say something that replays. I was thinking about that that T-shirt is something that replays that same mythology uh, more recently, just to show its persistence. Is the Transformers movie? I oh, I haven't seen, seen that, that either. Dang. Yeah, it's got and it, it, it's. I think it's not as you know. Uh, rich to look at it. I mean, it's basically got a kid in it, played by Shia LaBeouf, who, uh, you know, from the Indiana Jones adventure mode. But he is very much like a John Connor character. Uh, But he walks around all the time with a a t-shirt that just says the strokes on it. And it it seems to me that it's a a movie that's more about kind of brand placement and saying, oh, he's cool, he listens to some band that people listen to. It doesn't seem like there's as much of a, a very much about uh, the fear of blackness and the fear of blackness as technology and the black technology is that which must be uh, sacrificed uh, or demonized. 
you know, maybe we should we should get get a chance to get to the listeners. But I, I would say that um, Transformers very much replays the uh, the Terminator mythology in kind of a weakened, imitative form, but it's still very much there. Um, the Transformers are these uh, kind of robots from outer space. Uh, there's the idea that they, as in the Terminator, they're the ones who brought us the microchip era. We didn't have microchips before they sort of crash landed here. Um, and in the movie, they're trying to hack, uh, the bad robots are trying to hack into the defense mechanism, and they're very successful. Um, and it seems impossible that they would be able to, be able to, to hack into the way they do. And one of the things uh, one of the scientists says is, you know, there's no computer like this that could, that could do this this fast, unless it was like a biological computer. Um, and the very next thing you see is things have gotten to uh, a point where they need to have, um, you know, human resistance to these this technological threat. So they've, they've assembled all the young hacker kids to try to help them with this threat. And it's usually kind of scraggly bunch of, of pencil next geeks. But finally, uh, someone says there's only one person, there's only one hacker in the world that could help us. And sure enough, what do they do? They show up um, at the, the household of a young black man, and he's the one who's going to be the hacker that will be operating on the same level as these, so to speak, what have been described as biological robots. So there's a very strong equation there between the black man and the black machines. Wow. Uh, other people pointed out that uh, you know the, um, the the first the, the the one the one robot that dies is called Jazz. And he's mm. got a black voice, uh, played by a black actor. Um, I know there's a lot there's a lot going on with that movie, but uh, wow, lots of it. Star Wars as well. I didn't we didn't even uh, yeah. chat about yeah. that, but I mean, uh, matter of fact, I'm going to go to the phone line if you'll take yeah. uh, I guess whatever you can get out in two minutes about. Uh, Star Wars, I will say my one uh, tidbit, when I watch the film, I keep in mind, especially since I've seen the uh, recent three that came out, Darth Vader is a white person. Symbolically, yes, he's playing a non-white person, yeah, 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 and a uh, non-white person is doing his voice, but this is a white person. Uh, I view it as a battle between white people over the universe. Again, I just view everybody that is not a clearly identifiable person, those are the non-white people. So when I watch Star Wars, Yoda is a non-white person. Chewbacca is a non-white person. C-3PO is a non-white person. R2-D2 is a non-white person. The Ewoks are non-white people, and the way they relate to the people, the white people in the film, they relate to them as non-white people. They are here to serve. They're here to guide you along your journey and getting powerful to do your heroic whiteness and go out and conquer the world. We're just here to serve your needs and die off or be funny or Whatever, that's our purpose okay. to be here is to serve you. But, yeah, I'm going to go to the lines. If you could share uh, your thoughts, I guess, on Star Wars, and then we'll see what the callers have to say. Well, I mean, that, that's definitely that's so true about the Ewoks. The thing that I see most powerfully in, in Star Wars is that uh, the trajectory of the Darth Vader character who starts out as a white man uh, who has all kinds of, of white privilege, but who becomes a slave to the machine, uh, who in the process of becoming technologized, of, of becoming bit by bit, a cyborg um, comes to be figured as having become black because he has become a machine. Um, so he goes from being a, you know, the, the visible white body to the unseen body and the black voice. Um, and he's, the, he's the sort of the big bad guy, but he is also revealed as being ultimately a slave uh, to the empire and a slave to the emperor. Uh, that's sort of the tragic revelation of his story. So it's a, to me it's about the loss of you know, the pleasures of white privilege when one becomes technologized or incorporated into the machine. Groovy. Um, 954, you are on the air. 954, are you there? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes I'm here. Okay. Uh, this is Diva JC. I had my phone muted so that I wouldn't interrupt you at any time. Oh, okay. uh, I've been listening, you know, to this conversation. First of all, let me tell you, I am a, I have a master's degree in communication, and we studied film. And uh, I think that everything that you have said is so poignant. I wish 
that more people uh, would be listening to this um, program because there's just so much information that you give. Uh, I wanted to say that if, if you haven't seen the new movie by Beyonce, Obsessed, mm -hmm. I would suggest that you see that because everything that you're saying about the severance of the relationship between white women and black men is prolific and profound in this film. And the one that she did before that, Cadillac Records, showed the relationship between a white man and a black woman and uh, how he, when he was denied the uh, relationship, so to speak, he died. Uh, when you go back to the Matrix, and you, I think it's the Matrix, either Reloaded or Revolution, the architect is asked by Neo, was the person responsible for something the oracle, who happens to be a black woman, the architect's response is, oh, of course not. Like, a black woman has no power. And truly speaking, black women are on the bottom rung of society worldwide. And this is so evident in Hollywood, uh, to the fact that if you look at the movie that won, not won, but was nominated, uh, Doubt. Did either of you see that film? No, I did not. I did not. Okay. Well, that movie, you have to ask yourself, why was that movie uh, nominated? And why did Meryl Streep win? Well, the thing about it is, is that the female, religious, the nun, has been at the helm of educating children in this country, parochial. And this black woman in this film literally condoned the homosexual relationship between her son and the priest just so that he would have a friend. Now, that spoke volumes to me about how black women are disenfranchised, all the way to the fact that they're willing to, for their sons to be molested in order for them to have a relationship with a white male. So... That, that is actually castrating black men, you know, this film. But what I wanted to talk about, if I may have just a couple of more minutes of your time, is a book that I just published called A History of African American Jazz and Blues. And uh, it's three essays that I wrote for my master's degree. And one of them is called The Sign of the blues and everything that you've been talking about is encompassed in the study of semiotics, the science of signs and symbols. And you are right on point as far as the symbology involved in films in America that you don't see on British television or European television. You see more honest representation of people of color in Europe than you do in America. But that's a whole other show. So the symbology, the semiotics involved in how black people speak to each other and how they speak to white people and vice versa is uh, brought out in, you know, this, this, this essay that I wrote about the blues. The second essay is called Jazz, the Unmasked Rhetoric, and it shows how jazz music uh, acted as a conversation between black people 
and their former slavers and how they took the mask off that was evident in spirituals and in blues but is not there in jazz. So I, all I'm doing is agreeing with you. I don't have anything to disagree with you about. But I would say that your conversation about white supremacy and the context of it, I would have to probably have a show, and I do have a show called Music Women, Music Woman, that says that a lot of this marginalization between people of color and white people happens between men and women also so that there are two dynamics going on here. The first is power, and the second is survival. And so I'm going to leave you with that thought and see what you two gentlemen come up with what I've said. And I am a woman of color. Well, I think that's going to be the... Just to go to that very last categorical point, I think it's a very powerful one that, you know, explicitly what I've been talking about is whiteness, but implicitly what I've been talking about when I talk about these white heroes is white masculinity, right? So it, 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 it can very much be defined against a certain kind of powerless black womanhood, and that is very evident, as, as this caller has just said, in the Matrix, in the figure of the Oracle, um, who is treated in, in the movie The Matrix, uh, I think, in a pretty, uh, well, it, the, the movie makers don't seem to be completely in control of what they want to do, because when, when Neo first, uh, you know, the Keanu Reeves hero character first meets the Oracle, he gets to see the Oracle, and she says something like, oh, I'm not what you were expecting, uh, as if they feel like in portraying this oracle as a black woman, they're doing something progressive or unexpected or, or breaking an expectation. Um, but in fact, I mean, my reaction to that was, no, that, that wasn't what I wasn't expecting. I mean, here is this woman who is is portrayed as being, you know, the machine inside the machine. Uh, and as the caller, you know, uh, appropriately noted, whenever she's talked about, for example, in the conversation with the architect, it's not that she's granted any agency or power in having made the system go, but she's just somehow at the core of it, uh, not as the architect or the originator of it. Um, and I just think about her relationship or her interaction with that, with the Neil Keanu Reeves character. You know, when he meets her, is basically, I mean, he bakes her cookies. Uh, she bakes him cookies and says, here, you know, eat these cookies and you'll feel right as rain. I mean, it's a very traditional, uh, stereotypical, I mean, you know, to use the only word, it's, it's, it's a mammy figure, right, who is there just to serve and, and help this white hero feel better along his, his hero's quest at that moment. So, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, the, the, the white uh white privilege as defined to uh, as defined against the, the black man as the computer expert, yes, it's also important to remember figures like the Oracle, uh, the disempowered black woman who was also uh, very much a part of that, that picture. Um, I'm also very much intrigued by way, what you have to say about jazz. Uh, and I'm not you know, a scholar of this, so I, I would like to look more into it. But um, jazz is something that is very much signified on and with in these in these movies, it's it's uh, something that the, the Terminator uses to signify uh, in the construction of, of even the the name of someone like Miles Miles, the the computer expert, who seems to, in uh, the Joe Morton character who I said who is the the guy who brings about uh, you know the threat of the Black Planet, uh, you know seems to me to be an echo of Miles Davis that somehow this kind of technical prowess of jazz maps on to technical prowess uh, with the machines um, in a way that is maybe not entirely uh, welcome. So. Wow. Uh, again, Diva JC, very loyal listener. Um, thank you so much for uh, listening yes. and continuing to uh, call in, check out the program. Um, I will be listening. Her show actually comes on Blog Talk Radio Wednesdays uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern 
time. Um, check her show out, Diva JC. Uh, you can see she's all over the web. If you uh, do a search right. on her, she'll pop up. She has a website and everything. But you can just come to Blog Talk Radio if you want to check out her show. Anybody that's out there listening, Wednesdays, 6 p.m., Blog Talk Radio, Diva JC, uh, bringing in artists and always having uh, very enlightening, refreshing conversations about jazz music and the role of uh, non-white females, particularly in jazz, but non-white people. She's had uh, non-white males on her show uh, as well, uh, sharing their uh, their work and talking about the music and often mistreatment of non-white people uh, in that particular area. Uh, and her book as well. She has a brand new book uh, as well. Um, I wanted to... Uh, with the Matrix, I was looking for uh, some of the callers who uh, non-white people were going to call in to talk about the Matrix, and I'm not seeing them uh, online yet. So, uh, with the Matrix, um, I did not. When I first saw the film, I didn't I actually didn't even want to see the film at first. Uh, some people made me go see it, and I went and watched it, and didn't think anything more of it until years down the road. Uh, I did not really watch it thinking the non-white people here uh, are representing, or excuse me, the machines uh, are representation of non-white people until way down the road. Uh, much better understanding of racism, white supremacy, when I began to see that uh, connection in the matrix uh, and other aspects of racism, white supremacy, um, in how the oracle is portrayed, uh, how the architect talks about her, uh, the non-white character, um, how the uh, I guess the agents and the architect, how they function uh, as white people in the film, uh, and even how the non-white people, uh, Morris, uh, excuse me, uh, Morpheus, uh, played by Lawrence Fishburne, and uh, Tank, Dozer, Link, all the other non-white characters, how they function in relation to the non-white people in the film. Uh, and I know I've seen people say, well, uh, Morpheus, that role is great. It's wonderful for you know a black male to get this type of role where he's not subservient and uh, you know he's kind of the leader of their little gang here. And uh, you pointed out in your film where you can see other aspects where this looks exactly like the same racism, white supremacy being played out in a different form. Uh, could you talk about that aspect of uh, Morpheus's character in The Matrix? Well, I mean, uh, part of it is that uh, it, 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 Lord Cicero, in, in describing his role uh, in The Matrix, says that he is sort of taken out of uh, of the action loop and put into uh, a kind of a, a cognitive or, or spiritual realm. He actually, in the subsequent movies, does get to be more of a uh, of, of an action hero uh, in, in ways that may be interesting. But uh, um, he's also, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's it's just to me kind of even ugly to watch the degree to which he is the one who is made to to suffer uh, the in, the indignities of 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 being you know, strapped into the machine in this in this, in this horrible way. Uh, whereas you know Neo and, and Trinity, I mean their interaction with the machine is it's like a big video game for them. It's fun. Uh, they get to zoom around. They get to have you know infinite firepower, infinite guns, and. Uh, um, you know, uh, Morpheus is the one who has to sort of a be the be the thinker, uh, be the responsible one, not you know be out there uh, zooming and playing the video game, but then ultimately the one who has to 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 suffer uh, in a way that to me is kind of hard to watch uh, that that part of the movie. But uh, wow. is that that particular well, the scene where uh, the in the first Matrix when. Yes. Uh, he gives himself up so that uh, Neo can escape. Yes. Um, incredible oh, yeah. for me to watch. Oh, go ahead. No, that's right. I mean, that, this is you know that, that uh, you know, other uh, scholars before me I have made this comment. I think it was Ed Guerrero and Frame Black and says that it's you know it's always the, the black man that makes the sacrifice right, for the for the white man. But uh, oh yeah, yeah, he's all that matters, and then the police. Uh, <laughs> The police come in and beat him down. It's not even the agents. Actual enforcement officials come in and nightstick him away and bang, 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 and lead him off. Uh, you know, we see that every day. Um, yeah, it just, it just, the, I mean, it's just, it's just the pointed indignity of everything about the way that, I mean, like, he gets his head busted over a toilet, you know, just, uh, mm. you know, just, he's just at the bottom of the, of the kind of level of abuse that is, that is portrayed there. And the kind of, just really supremely, uh, just the kind of the distaste that uh, the agents are allowed to express towards him and his, uh, the 
discussed that uh, the agent expresses towards him as, as being a bodily thing. Um, mm. It's another thing that is, is uh, uh, that on the one hand, you know, he's someone who is the perfect victim for the machine, but um, he is a sort of a, a potential, uh, something that, that that is not like a machine. He is and is not like a machine, and the machines um, both hate him for that and also incorporate him into the machine at the same time. For uh, the folks listening, if you click tick the talk, click to talk button, you can come in and listen to the remainder of the show, or you can just call in. Uh, the number is 347-215-6071. Uh, caller 414, you are on the air. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. Um, I just want to know how can we get his book? Oh, Dr. there you go. Dr. Kevorkian? Oh, uh, well, this is, you know, I, I just, I'm, uh, I'm uh, supposed to say, you know, it's on Amazon.com. It's just called Color Monitors. Uh, okay. uh But it came out in 2006, uh, and uh, what, what that means is, is that uh, I think they're paperback. It's not out of print in paperback, but there are also... You know, you would probably readily find used copies of uh, places on the on the internet. This is one of the bizarre things I found out as an author in, in the internet age. Uh, I set up a Google search just to kind of see, uh, you know, what was happening with the book. And mm-hmm. the first the first hits I got on the Google search is there actually was an eBay page for reselling my book used before it was on the Amazon page for selling it new. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> So, in other words, someone had got an advanced copy of it, like for review or something, and was selling it used before, you know, the the, the original copies got out there. So, kind of an amazing fact about publishing in the internet age. So, um, yeah, the so the like the like the cover price is like seventeen ninety five, you know, paperback, but you could probably get it for less. Yeah. Okay. I learned <laughs> a lot. Right. I learned a lot. All right. Thank you. Right on. And you're a non-white person, yes. Yes. Right on. Yes. Right on. And, you have... and I just want to say, um, I'm starting to see racism, white supremacy in television, especially the Animal Planet. Animal Planet. See, this is this is what I love is when people come with like, tell me you got to watch this, you got to watch that, you like the the obsessed Beyonce movie or Animal Planet. I mean that, which just is our is our you know our host is you know uh, Gusty Running was saying you know, you know be aware of. You know, have the portrayal of these entities, which are not the white people. Right? Mm-hmm. What do you see like an animal planet? Uh, I okay. It was like three months ago. It was kind of funny. Uh, it was about a white uh, albino tiger, hmm. uh, albino lion, and an alligator, and it was like um, their quest to survive in the world and how the non-white animals were, you know, making sure he was making sure that the white tiger or whatever was taken care of. Mm-hmm. And also uh, they had another show about a white tiger that was born in the zoo. And the uh, the trainers, the I guess the handlers, were trying their best to make sure that the white tiger was taken care of. And I saw that, so... Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you say, "Oh, well, that that was just a story." But then the other hand, well, why why is that a story that that people love to tell or that they you know want that right. wants to be emphasized? Yeah, yeah. We we had a uh, another caller uh, join in. This is two hundred two. I believe this is Mr. Josh Wicket. Is uh, oh, Josh. you know what? I, I was thinking of him. Although you mentioned him earlier, but I was thinking I should have quoted him on. The Matrix, but uh, as you did, but I, I remember one of the things that he puts in uh, his review of the Matrix is the definition of the root word of Matrix, and maybe mm-hmm. he wants to say a word about that. But um, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Mr. Wicket speak. <laughs> are you are you on the line with us, Mr. Wicket? Two hundred two. Yes, I am. Hello. Hello. How are you, Hello? sir? Hello. I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I had a question for the professor, and I want to know if he coined a term to describe these uh, non-white people who help the white main character in the movie with their technical abilities. Did you coin a term for the 
for the role? Uh, I guess I refer to it a couple of different ways. I mean, I wouldn't say that it, uh, I coined it, but I do refer to them as peripheral characters, and that's a term that people, you know, you would find that in drama reviews or movie reviews. But I want to think about it in the specific instance of technology, where a peripheral is a device that's hooked up to a central processor and is is made to, to serve it. You know, a peripheral like a printer or a scanner or a mouse. That uh, um, so I, I think of them. Yeah, I, I think of this role as, as the you know the, the, the peripheral character. Um, what other? Maybe, I, maybe I've a, heard it. I've heard it referred to as tontos. Oh, uh huh. No, I I have a derogatory uh, way to describe it, but that's one yeah. term I've heard. And the reason yeah. I asked the question is because I want to know if you had any examples of the opposite of the tonto. Oh, that's good. Um, I should be looking for that. I mean, that's what it's, it's sort of. It, do you have? Oh, well, example? I think I might have one for you. Um, are right. you familiar with a movie called Liberty Stand Still? No, no. Liberty stands still. Okay. Yes. And the reason I bring that up is because I think it might be an example of the opposite of the the phenomenon you describe in your book because it's a case of a non-white person who takes all their skills and ability that they got from white people and uses it against them. Uh-huh, uh-huh, right. Right. I mean, it, yeah. And that, that's. That, I mean, that's an important um, thing. I think uh, that I want people to understand about the, the critique uh, that I'm making. That let's say I'm critiquing uh, mainstream popular entertainment that portrays black people as computer experts. Uh, this doesn't mean that I think it's bad for black people to become computer experts, right? To, to, to master this technology rather than be mastered by it. Uh, the question is what kind of fantasy is being sold in those representations where the black computer expert is just being made to serve a central whiteness. Um, but it, I, I don't want people to think like, oh, well, you know, if uh, people of other races learn how to use computers, then they're just working for the man. No. Not not at all, not necessarily, and in fact, uh, part of one of the challenges of the book is to get people to get past their own sort of disempowered relationship to technology or the tools of oppression, whatever they might be. Uh, you, you, uh, you, when you first came online, you said, you know, you're still learning. Yeah, we're, 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 we're all still learning, and that includes, you know, maybe learning some new tricks from the, from the technological toolkit. But I'll have to check out that movie. What, what, how, how recent is that? I think it's uh, 2000, maybe 1999. Mm -hmm. All right. It's it's Wesley Snipes playing uh -huh. Sniper. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. But uh, it's a very interesting movie. Um, I had one other question. Are you familiar with the um, Star Trek Next Generation? A, a, a little bit, you know. W one example that comes up, you know, when I talk to people about this, is is people mention um, Jordy LaForge. Yes, uh, that's yes. exactly what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Well, what do you? I mean, I think that he is a, an example of, you know, the, the the black man who has been you know, integrated to technology. That, I mean, that uh, it's it's striking that you know the the person that you know the the actor of color who's chosen to portray. Uh, this person who has this kind of cyborgian vision uh, capacity. Um, that, uh, well, well, you know, I was initially I, I never really watched the the series because I was initially annoyed that they made the black character wear this thing covering his eyes. Yeah. And I asked yeah. people about it. Did it give him extra power or make him smarter or something like that? And I never got an ans a straight answer as regarding what that was about. But I felt that. It diminished the character to have his eyes covered like that, and it reminded me of things you see in medical textbooks where they put the black strip across the eyes of the person in the yeah. picture. Yeah. No, I mean I think that that this is one of the fundamental, you know, symbolic moves uh, in denying a person his or her humanity is to deny them their their eyes, 
or the right of looking. Um, the right of looking, I mean, it's, uh, that is something that in this country has been very much regulated, right? What looks are appropriate? Uh, you know, what kinds of eye contact are appropriate? These are something that is sort of at the core of, you know, on a basic day-to-day -day interaction in the history of racism. You know, what can black men or black women look at? Can they make eye contact with white people? Can black men look at white women being sort of the, the prime instance, but only one of the instances? So yeah, the denial of the face, the denial of the eyes, seems to be one of the, the key ways in which humanity is, is diminished or denied. Um, another one is, of course, the denial of language. That's another kind of, of stereotype. And I think that that's um, in sort of shifting um, one of the stereotypes of blackness onto this idea of being technologically adept. It's, it's a sort of celebration, oh, look, uh, these characters are good at computers, but um, they are not being celebrated for things like their verbal power, uh, which are uh, also lost. So there's the issue of voice as well as the issue of of looking. But uh, uh, I, I just have one other question. I was wondering if you've noticed a narrative that says when the black person is smart and not serving white people or, or functioning in support of the goals of white people, then they turn out to be a disaster. Well, I, I, what I see is that they turn out to be, uh, uh, what it, what, 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 one version of that script is that they turn out to be uh, well, dangerous. Well, that's kind of um, and, and I, I, Hill is an example of that. Yeah, well, you know what's interesting is another example of that is Demolition Man, and again, it's Wesley Snipes. That there, Wesley Snipes is portrayed as having a very unique ability to interact with the machine. As soon as he, he's, he's like this very dangerous criminal who's been in the deep freeze, and as soon as he comes out of, uh, you know, gets thawed out, he immediately has this kind of rapport with the computer, he's able like, to speak with the computer and acquire all these kind of skills from the computer, uh, and because of a very dangerous, threatening presence uh, that then has to be disciplined and contained by uh, the macho Rambo, you know, Stallone character, uh, the masculine whiteness, then has to clamp down on that because he has a technological uh, mastery that is not in the service of society, but is rather in, in, in criminal enterprises. So yeah, that it's yeah that would be one version of that uh, disaster. But that's something that goes back to um, really the fears of, of slave revolts back in the in the 19th century. This is uh, uh, something that that uh, Herman Melville writes about in in the in the, the, the short novel Benito Cerreto. Uh Speaking of you know literary trails. You know, I first read Invisible Man, and the epigraph for Invisible Man is from Benito Cerreto, so then I read Benito Cerreto. Uh, but that uh, is, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't give it away, but it, it portrays a slave revolt on a ship that is led by uh, a character by the name of Babo. And the, the narrator describes his head as being a hive of subtlety. Uh, that here is someone who is a black man who's got it all figured out, who's smart, he knows all the angles, um, and it's it's being portrayed as a as a slave revolt that has to be somehow contained by by authority. Um, okay, well, Gus, I don't want to take over your show, but I want to leave. Oh no, do um, your thing. Go ahead. Go so ahead. I'll, I'll leave you guys with one other um, thing you might want to check out in the uh, 1960s um, version of Star Trek. The the series, mm -hmm. there's a there's one called The Ultimate Computer, and sure. it's about, are you familiar with that one? No. And it, it's a computer called M5, and it's um, built by, it's invented by a black man, and he yeah. uses some of his brain cells for this computer because it's like the ultimate computer. Now, what's interesting about this is this is 1960s, so usually when a black person was on a show like Star Trek, it was to be killed, to, to serve as a, you know, somebody to kill off. You know, Eddie Murphy makes jokes about that. But um, the, the computer, they're, they're testing it out in the ship, and the computer takes over the ship and ends up destroying other ships because the ultimate goal of the computer is self-preservation. 
And I thought it was interesting that they used a black man as the inventor of the computer that goes out of control and starts killing everybody. Yeah, even to the extent that part of his body is, becomes part of the machine. He, you say he actually uses his cells, right? Yeah, yeah. They, he uses, because yeah. that's the new, the, the thing that this black scientist is famous for. He came up with a way to use brain cells inside of a computer chip. And it just so happens that he used some of his on this computer called M5, which they're testing on the, on the Enterprise. Yeah. And, and um, Kirk starts to get um, jealous because the computer can make decisions faster than him. But then when they try to shut the computer off, the computer has disabled the ability to shut it off. Then it starts attacking other ships in Starfleet. Hmm. Which it, one is this again? It's called the Ultimate Computer. The ultimate computer. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, you, you'll see reference to it. But it's one of the, the early shows where, uh, before you saw black people all the time on TV shows, but they had this this um, black scientist um, invent this computer, and I just thought that was interesting. And one other thing, um, you were talking about the uh, black sonar expert on what is it, the hunt for Red October? October. Yeah, that whole thing of black people and communications, there was also um, Hogan's hero, Sergeant Kinch. He was the radio yeah. man. And then right. there's Uhura on Star Trek. But this whole thing about black people can hear something that other people can't hear. You know, I, I just thought that was a narrative. Anyway, um, Gus, um, back to your show. I just wanted to call in, and um, um, it's a great show, and uh, it's really interesting. Appreciate it. You, um, when I was telling you about the show, you had a question about um, perhaps seeing if uh, Mr. Kevorkian, if he had a theory on why these representations uh, are present. Uh, if you recall, I don't, I don't uh, recall the exact phrasing that you used in the question, but I thought oh, that was I, interesting. The reason I, I think he pretty much answered that. Uh, throughout the show, he's kind of describing it all comes down to white supremacy, mm. I think. Did, was, was that your basic answer, uh, Dr. Kevorkian? Yeah, that, that, that this is a, this is a, a, a way of you know, either in real life or in, even just an escapist fantasy of imagining white privilege as something that doesn't have to dirty its hands with figuring out the technology. Um, I think that even goes hand in hand with, the, with this, what you're just saying about the, um, the kind of mysterious uh, connection of the black body to the, to the machine, that it isn't even somehow fully explained, it's somehow mystical or, or spiritual, um, that it's uh, a way of uh, that white privilege can even uh, celebrate its own ignorance about the machine, and at the same time, its own ignorance about black people. That sort of a, it, both can remain a kind of unexplained mystery, and uh, uh, white privilege can go about its its its, uh, its own enjoyment of that uh, of the life that it has. So, yeah, I always thought it was interesting to see the contrast between putting a black male, generally. Um, more emotional and nonlinear in their thought process mm -hmm. in contrast with a machine, which is like the exact opposite. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, th I think that the one, one of the, yeah, one of the stereotypes of, uh, uh, you know, is, is that, uh, that there can be a, a mystical or, or even non-rational uh, connection to the machine. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I think is being projected there. So... Yes. Okay. Well, that's all I had. Um, continue on, Gus. Great show. Thank you for calling in, Mr. Wicked. Again, I hope the listeners will check out Mr. Wicked's uh, review of The Matrix. Uh, it is posted at thecode.net. And actually, you can be lazy because I put the link for it in the show description. If you uh, look at the show description, you might have to click the uh, blue tab for expand for it to drop down so you can see the entire description. But there should be a link for uh, his film review for The Matrix. Uh, thank you for calling in, Mr. Wicked. Uh, always a pleasure to be able to dialogue with you, sir. All right. Yeah, thank you. If, uh, yeah. Thank you. If I could just say briefly that what, uh, what I was reminded of earlier, the fact that he puts in the definition for the matrix, which is easy to forget, but he says the original definition, definition of a matrix is the womb. In the Latin sense, matrix means womb. Uh, and the great horror of the matrix is that the womb has become technological, uh, that it's a, it's a vision of the future in which
which is instead of le leading free lives, you know, human beings are, have become copper top batteries hooked up to the machine in these artificial wombs. Um, but just to go back to the whole John Connor, Sarah Connor core of the Terminator myth, uh, this is all about protecting that white maternal relationship, the white mother and the white child. Um, in the Matrix, insofar as the Matrix becomes the black machine, that is the ultimate threat or the ultimate nightmare or violation of, of the loss of the natural womb, uh, which is the thing that is being celebrated and protected against technology in the Terminator, Terminator series. So I just think that the nightmare of the Matrix is well illustrated by what Mr. Wicked points out uh, as being that core thing. We think of the Matrix and we just think, oh, well, it's a an action movie with Keanu Reeves and it's about technology or I think of Matrix as some kind of mathematical technological thing, but um, it was originally a reference to a womb, which I think is mm. it's kind of, it's kind of mind-blowing for me. Wow. I know uh, I'm going to get Diva JC. She has a hand up. Uh, 414, did you have oh. a, a question or a comment uh, on what you've heard? Uh, no, but the Matrix is on right now on TNT. Oh. The one right now. Wow. Wow. Which one? The first one, second one? The first one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The Matrix has you. Yeah. Wow. I I have uh I believe uh seen some report that there's supposed to be a fourth one uh coming at some point. I don't know if that's true or not, but um huh. I have seen reports that it is supposed to be uh coming down the pike uh eventually. Um yeah. Wow. Well, um, well you, I mean oh, you, you mentioned you mentioned earlier about Terminator 2 being you know, one of the biggest box office ever. But I think, you know, what, what, what Dave J.C. has just, just pointed out is something that is even, you know, harder to measure than box office. I mean, there are movies that do huge at the box office, but there are some of them that they just do that big box office and you kind of never hear from them again, but then there are a few, a very finite few movies that I feel really somehow tap a nerve and they become part of the culture and they're handed down from generation to generation. Um, and I mean, I still, when I talk to my students, you know, 20 years later about Die Hard, they've all still seen Die Hard. They've all seen Terminator 2. They've all seen The Matrix. Uh, you know, a lot of my movie references that I remember, you know, I mentioned them in class to my students. They look at me like an old person, like, what? You know? But do you say there, there's like a handful that really became the fairy tales for our time that everyone knows? And I think that the Terminator 2, Die Hard, and The Matrix are somehow hit some sort of main line of what people want to consume, the story they want to tell each themselves over and over again. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, the box office speaks for itself worldwide uh, with regards yeah. to those. And the fact that they, uh, the fact that they've been replicated, I mean, you've yes. got for the, uh, the new Terminator, I, according to the report I saw, this is supposed to be another trilogy. So there's supposed to be oh, wow. three more of these uh, coming out. Uh, I hard. Whoa. Uh, yeah, Die Hard, uh, there are four of those. Uh, is someone on speakerphone here? I think that's me. That's, you said Diva JC, and I got online. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, yeah. Um, the fact that these are being replicated, I think, speaks to that. Uh, Diva JC, go ahead. Well, this is just so – I think you need to run this show about four months. Just let it run and let – because – our entire history in this country is played out in film. And we go to these movies for entertainment, but we don't understand how it is registering in our subconscious mind subliminally. And so what Dr. Kevorkian, by the way, your name is related to that other person, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you can spell the other one, you can spell mine, yeah. <laughs> um, but are you, are you a professor of film? What is your, what is your feel? It's uh, really primarily American literature. American literature and culture, I would say. But, yes, no, I, primar I primarily am a, a literature professor. So I, I'm not schooled in the sort of the, uh, the disciplines of film criticism, such as I understand that you have a background in, in communications, which right. uh, uh, permits, uh, you know, gives you an ability maybe to talk about film um, from a different, you know, different perspective, uh, but, you know, how films can be made and things like that. Um, I tend to read them as texts, so to speak. Um, 
But I mean, what you said about uh, you know the unconscious, uh, they are also you know you can read them as dreams. Right? These are you go to the movie theater if you are, or or at home. I mean, it's something that we all do together in the dark. It's a kind of a collective shared dream. And uh, as such, I think it is a, it is appropriate, as you said, to think about interpreting it um, as an un, uh, the unconscious wishes that are being projected up there in the dark. Yes, but also now, we went all the way back to um, uh, Hitchcock, and Hitchcock was a misogynist, which means that he didn't like women, Mm -hmm. and he had a strange relationship with his mother, and that translated into his films, and uh, what you said about the womb, I contend that music begins in the womb. Uh, and that women have traditionally been marginalized in the music industry, particularly jazz, uh, which becomes a domain of the masculine. And I know, you know, Gus and I have this conversation all the time, the difference between um, male supremacy and white supremacy. Uh, the fact is, is that we on this planet are coming to a point of equality whether we want it or not. So there's got to be a balance between the male and the feminine and between the different races. So that is the ultimate uh, in my mind. But without these conversations, uh, that that equity cannot even be realized so Gus is providing a service here that really, I'm, you know, I'm on the Internet every day, all day. I'm the web diva. Mm-hmm. And you can't find conversations like this on the Internet. People are talking about uh, life coaching and, you know, there's a show called Ancestral Legacy where a woman talks to Lisa I can't think of her name. I can't think of her last name. But anyway, on live conversations, and she's talking about how in our DNA, uh, slavery is in everybody's DNA, not just the slaves, but the slaveholders. So all of the, the karmic result of that is in everybody's DNA because there's only one of us here. We're all cells in the same body. Um, so I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is honoring what Gus is doing here and you're joining him and the other gentleman. I did go to his website. And I'm saying that this conversation needs to be promoted all over the Internet so that people will understand that there is a need for us to move away from the separation of power, the separation of uh, of privilege, you know, the privileged versus the non-privileged, which would be men against women, uh, old people against young people, and so forth and so on. So I applaud you, Gus, for this program, and every time I get a chance, I come to your show, and Dr. Gavaki, and I hope that your books uh, will be picked up, you know, in, in more than just literature classes, because certainly white supremacy has been blatant in literature, as it is in film and music, you know, yet and still the music of black people permeates the planet, has been taken used by groups like the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and made lots of money from that music, whereas the innovators of the music find it very difficult to make a living. So on all levels, from film all the way down to, you know, handcrafts, um, there has to be more equity. And that's it. All right. You know, I could talk about this forever because this is what I do. I promote women in music, women whose music will never get on mainstream radio. And I'm hoping to do a film about a documentary 
about women in jazz and blues who brought the music of Americans to the forefront of society in America and abroad, but most of them died penniless, you know. And so the equity as far as income is concerned, even you're talking about technology, well, a Nigerian man, Philip, I can't say his last name, but look him up. He actually invented the Internet. How many people know that an African man invented the Internet? You know, there was a black man on the team of um, IBMers, I think it was, who invented the computer. You know, but we always look at technology and all the higher sciences as white uh, fields of endeavor when that is not true at all. Women have been responsible for most of the inventions in the household simply by, you know, because of a need. And so, again, I'm very happy to be here with you, and I, I will tell people about this show, and, and you tell people, you know, to listen to this show, Gus. Send it out. Keep blasting it, because what you are doing is so important, and I thank you. Thank you for listening and uh, calling in. Again, check out our show, Blog Talk Radio, Wednesdays, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 o'clock Pacific, uh, Jazz, Diva JC. Thank you and loyal listenership. I appreciate it wholeheartedly. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Kevorkian, I did want to ask, um, I plan on checking out the book, again, for our listeners, White by Law, Legal Construction of Race. Uh, if you could uh, perhaps share one other book that you think would be helpful in understanding racism, white supremacy, because um, this one sounds really juicy, one of the books that you think uh, does an extraordinary job uh, of discussing this subject matter. That's a good question. Uh, you know, in uh, uh, you know, in the literary realm, uh, one that obviously had a very profound influence on me was a work of Toni Morrison called *Playing in the Dark: uh, Whiteness uh, and, the, and the Literary Imagination*. Um, and that is, it, it talks about a lot of things. Diva J.C. J. J. was speaking of how, about how much white supremacy pervades uh, the literary imagination. Um, so Toni Morrison, Plain of the Dark, it's a, it's a short, powerful book. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's uh, one of the things that is very, that's, that's new, uh, and I, I can't testify to it in, in the same way. I've just checked it out for the library. Um, that's kind of in the more in that white by law vein. Uh, it's called What Blood Won't Tell, A History of Race on Trial in America uh, by Ariala. J. Gross, uh, just published in 2008. Um, uh, chapter 1, The Common Sense of Race. Chapter 2, Performing Whiteness. Chapter 3, Race as Association. Um, and then looking at some more case studies of uh, different subgroups in their relationship to, to whiteness. Um, so I guess that, that would be more uh, you know, in, the, in the kind of legal history sense. Wow. Uh, I would say that there, I would just I wanted to summarize actually one of the important findings though of, of of white by law that reminds me of you know that chapter one in this what blood won't tell the common sense of race, mm. uh, which is that he he summarizes at the end of the book I, I said he gives you all those court cases and how they ruled like well if it's Malaysian or Burmese is that white is it not white, um, but he breaks down what the rationale was for each of these judgments. Uh, you know, why was it said that the Chinese were white? So he's got several different things. It could either be by quote unquote scientific evidence that somehow you could say that there's some racial difference, or the opinion would be cited would be quote common knowledge. Well, everybody knows the Burmese aren't white, so to speak, right? And the interesting trend that he finds is that in the earlier court cases, uh, there was more of an attempt to cite scientific evidence. Uh, of sort of you know absolute racial difference, but it just wouldn't wash, right? It, it, it just wouldn't hold up. And so as these cases go on more and more frequently, uh, what becomes the legal standard is common knowledge. In other words, they couldn't base a, a, an adjudication of, of whiteness, oh, you're white or you're not white, based on 
true scientific evidence. So instead, they referred to what the, basically the stereotypes that were present in the culture. So the law became a way of just reproducing what everyone already thought uh, uh, because the, the, the scientific basis of race didn't, didn't hold up. So, um, it's, it, so it's, it's an important notion not to discount, you know, race happens. Race is something that people experience very profoundly. Um, but again, to see it almost from a literary sense, what people say about race is that it is a fiction. It's a very dangerous fiction. It's a very powerful fiction. Um, but it's one that if you, you look at how the Supreme Court argued about it, uh, they had to, in order to sustain whiteness, had to make recourse to sort of the weak argument, well, common knowledge, hmm. what whiteness is. Wow. Okay. So we have... Uh, it sounds like at least two good ones, uh, white by law, legal construction of race, and what blood won't tell. Is the author of what blood won't tell, is that a white person or a non-white person? I do not know. Uh, I, the uh, full name, is, I don't know her work, Ariola J. Gross, so I do not, I do not know. Uh, hmm. Interesting. I will, those are both on my list to, uh, to check out here. Uh, last one before I uh, wrap things up. I wanted to ask you, uh, what problem is color monitors attempting to call attention to and or solve? Okay, well, it, I guess part of it, uh, just to go back to what, what Tony Morrison says, uh, is that um, one of the problems is that we perceive ourselves sometimes, and people say we perceive ourselves as being in a, in a post-racial society in which it's considered, uh, as she says, not polite to notice things pertaining to race. As if we're, you know, that's not polite conversation and that's not something that should we, we should be thinking about. Um, so in sort of the very general sense, uh, which even David J.C. Is, is, is talking about, uh, one of the problems is is to uh, to challenge a culture that can be very self-congratulatory about how far it thinks it has come on the issue of race. To sort of look at unexamined issues of of inequality uh, uh, that they as they are revealed in the conscious or unconscious of these of these popular forms of escape. Um, so yeah, problem. Uh, the, ch the problem is that the people don't want to think about these uh, questions. They think of some of these questions as being, the problem is that people don't think there is a problem. Um, mm. Mm. That, is that too general? Is that, uh, let's see if I can restate. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem uh, people do not talk about racism, white supremacy, and where it is manifested uh, in the different works that you cite, in either advertisements, film, literature, that people do not talk about it, and or they do not perceive the system of white supremacy to be a problem. And your book attempting to point out that this, uh, that white supremacy is present in these different areas and that this is incorrect and we should be working to do away with this, the system of white supremacy. Would that be an accurate yeah, way of restating? Yeah, it would be more than accurate. See, it would be, that's where I'm grateful for your clarity. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no, it, I would say very much so. I was thinking of another way of stating um, one challenge that the book might pose. Uh, we were sort of talking somewhat jokingly earlier about the, the, the notion of uh, you know, watching movies and being lazy, right? You said, oh, you know, right, we sort of joked about the, the lazy thing. And then, but then, of course, it's very clear that the manner in which you watch movies is not a lazy way of doing it. You enjoy them as entertainment, but you also perceive them as food for thought, for, for instruction, something that you do uh, mental work about. Uh, one of the things that I was interested in in doing this research and thinking about racism generally, um, was a, was a book uh, by Wendell Berry called The Hidden Wound, uh, which is a history of, of racism. 
And uh, you know, one of the, the questions, I mean, you know, where does racism come from? Uh, I mean, you could, it's very easy for, for people to think, oh, well, it's just natural. You know, people look different and people hate people that are, are different or look different or can be said to be different. And maybe it's a chicken or egg thing, but what Wendell Berry says is one of the or ways of thinking about a motivation for racism is that it begins with people's laziness, with um, a laziness that manifests itself in a belief that one is superior to one's conditions, that there are certain things that one doesn't have to do and which other people should do for you. Right? Um, so, uh, and it is only after this that sort of ideas of of constructing race come into play. Well, you know, if I don't want to do a certain kind of work, and I want to be exempted from doing a certain kind of work or occupying a certain position in society, then it's going to be in my interest to come up with some sort of system of difference whereby I'm on, I'm in an in group and someone else is in the out group. So, I, I, to me, that was instructive as a you know something to try out of. Racism is racism is race as not something that's pre-existing, but a system that's actually constructed, sort of after the fact, because of uh, you know people in power being lazy and wanting other people to do the work for them. I mean, the, and the, the the most dramatic instance of that is of course slavery. The the belief that it's sort of natural for people uh, you know to serve and other people to be to be masters. Um, but so the challenge then is uh, just on a very personal basis, individual one by one basis, just to be very wary of uh, what kinds of behaviors does do I partake in that are motivated by my own laziness? Uh, what kind of things that do I do that make work for other people that isn't necessarily their job to take care of? Um, just kind of on a a database basis to, to watch one's own laziness. I think it, another one is, is fear. Uh, be very careful about things that one is afraid of and be willing to question that. If I'm afraid of technology or if I'm afraid of people who look different than me, that, that that's something I need to think about. What, what are the things that make me afraid? Because I think those are, I think fear and laziness, if you want to kind of take it almost to you know, moral or ethical terms might be some of the root causes of this other great, you know, uh, sin or crime that, you know, we call racism. Wow. Just uh, as a non-white person uh, and hearing that and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I could be incorrect. That's one thing I didn't point out as, as much as I probably should have in this uh, in this program. Uh, my show, I never... Uh, want to tell anyone I'm an expert on anything because I certainly am not. Um, the show, I just try to present information and hope that the listeners will think for themselves and evaluate what they've heard and come to their own conclusions about what they think is accurate and makes sense to them. Um, for myself, uh, I spoke with an admitted white supremacist. Uh, his name is Eric Hamilton. He is a instructor at the University of Washington. Uh, and He said, and I quote, we, meaning white people who practice white supremacy, we work hard to work easier in mistreating non-white people. Direct quote uh, from this gentleman, admitted white supremacist Eric Hamilton. Um, it's been my experience and my observation, the white people who practice racism, white supremacy, uh, they are very efficient and I don't know if I would say they, these are lazy people who are practicing racism, white supremacy. It seems that they devote a lot of time and energy to uh, making sure that this system works and continues to function in an optimal manner. Um, I perceive in terms of the laziness and the fear, um, I see that more with the non-white people in uh, being afraid to confront the awesome power that is the system of white supremacy. Uh, and uh, I don't want to say it's late. it's part of the victimization. It is part of the abuse that non-white people get uh, in, number one, not knowing what to do about the system of racism, white supremacy, and looking to someone else to fix this problem, be it other white people, other non-white people, and not each individual victim of white supremacy taking it upon themselves to say, okay, 
this is having an adverse impact on my existence. I should be doing something uh, to correct this problem. Uh, those are two things that I see more with non-white people in terms of being lazy, not active in combating racism, white supremacy, which again is part of their victimization and conditioning, and to the uh, fear of doing something, the fear of confronting that awesome power of the system uh, of white supremacy. Um, I did I did want to point out, because uh, I saw one of the people in the chat room, I do try to keep an eye out, one of the people in the chat room, they had the same uh, thought that I did about the term whiteness, uh, I would say whiteness and other, uh, because I, and other pops up in your book a lot. Uh, I don't think those are the most accurate terms. I think it would be much clearer and much more accurate if the term non-white was used in place of uh, other, yeah. uh, because I, yeah. other is very unclear. It's other than yeah. what, other than who, uh, and I hear that used a lot. And I just, it's just not accurate. You want to be accurate yeah. with terms. Non-white would be very clear. Uh, and even better would be victim of white supremacy. Uh, your colleague, Robert Jensen, when he was on the show, uh, he illustrates in his book, Heart of Whiteness, that non-white is a more accurate term than people of color. And he beautifully yeah. breaks down the logic of why that is. And I, according to his own logic, I said, so victim of white supremacy would be an even more accurate term than non-white, and he conceded that that is true, and he conceded that as a white person, the term victim of white supremacy bothered him, and he said that he suspects that is his conditioning as a white person in the system of white supremacy to have an aversion to that term because it's calling attention to non-white people being abused by white people and his culpability in that process. So that would be my thought that Perhaps if you do an, uh, an update, perhaps knock out the term other uh, and whiteness, because I also think that's confusing because it uh, tends to remove culpability from white people. Uh, and, and he uh, says in his book, page 92, Robert Jensen in the Heart of Whiteness, page 92, the problem is white people. And I think that is extremely important for non-white people to not forget that. Uh, that's why I put that in my definition, a system of people who classify themselves as white, um, because whiteness makes it this nebulous, you know, ambiguous thing, uh, like, you know, what, what are we talking about when we say whiteness? I think it's very important that non-white people be able to put a face on this to say this is a problem that people are causing by what they do, what they do not do, what they say, and what they don't say. I think it's very important that we uh, address this as a problem that is because of what people who practice racism are doing. So those, And that's pretty much the only suggestion I would have that might make the book a little better is just being a little more accurate with terms. But other than that, brilliant, brilliant work. Those are excellent, excellent points. I've I mean, written this all down. I mean, it, the precision of, of what you stated there. Um, well, the first one I wrote down is we work hard to work easier, which I think is profound from, from your other yes. Uh, but the idea of speaking of non-white rather than, than other, uh, it immediately strikes me as being on target. Uh, what Bob Jensen says about the discomfort of the term white supremacy and victim of white supremacy also strikes me as very useful. But um, yeah, to go back to accurate language and even the kind of general idea that I was trying to fumble towards about um, language existing in a system of difference, I mean, by simply saying, by, by putting it just out there in that simple opposition, white people and not non, non-white non people, I mean, that's the best example of what I was trying to say vaguely about a principle of verbal clarity, right? That Every term exists in relation to its opposite. Well, how much more pure can you get? I mean, what's the opposite of white people? It's not other. The opposite of white people is non-white people. Right? It's a complete closed circuit, and it's a completely precise definition. So, um, yeah, that would be that would be both at the heart of what I would be seeking in terms of, of verbal accuracy, and I think it's close to, as you say, what Bob Jensen talks about as the heart of uh, the heart of whiteness as being as being white people uh, as defined against non-white people. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for those things. I, I don't know if my publisher will uh, give me the luxury.
history of the second edition, but uh, it's something I will think about in my scholarship as I go forward, for sure. Well, that's appreciated for sure. And hopefully, people, hopefully, lots of people will tune into this show and they will go out and buy the book. And they'll say, "Wow, this book is selling a lot." They'll, ha- we'll they'll, have, to, they'll have to. <laughs> we'll have to fix it. Yeah. yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, again, Doctor Martin Kavorkian, author of. Uh, color monitors, the black face of technology in America, uh, professor, University of Texas, Austin. Uh, I have immensely enjoyed uh, discussing this issue with you today. I think it has been informative for our listeners. I have learned a lot. I'm going to get these books to see if they're here. I'm also going to get, uh, is it Westworld, the one you were speaking about uh, in your book where the, uh, they have the robot theme park and the robots go crazy and attack, uh, yeah. is that the name of it? Yeah. Yeah, that is, I, that is. That's one of the early some of the early work of Michael Crichton. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was blown away and, and uh you pointing out uh the non white actor who was in Anna and the King uh being placed in the role uh, of the robot that wigs out and, and begins attacking the white people. I I have seen the version of uh Anna and the King uh where he's in it, so I uh, I'm I'm going to get that film in the next few days to check it out and watch it. So, like I said, I learned a ton reading your book. I took tons of notes, um, learned a lot, very informative, and I learned a lot speaking with you today. Um, I, I'm just very appreciative for you taking your time to uh, speak with us and our listeners. Um, yeah, it's it's really been a treat. Well, th- thank you so much for bringing your, bringing your insight to the table, for your patience with my sometimes rambling professorial manner, and uh, <laughs> really thanks thanks to the uh, to the, the listeners similarly for for their ideas and their insights, and uh, it's been a, it's been a great opportunity for me. So so thank you, thank you. Not a problem at all. Thank you a lot again, Dr. Martin Kavorkian, uh, University of Texas Austin author of Color Monitors, our guest today. I uh, appreciate you for taking the time out. Busy weekend for calling in for the show, and uh, perhaps we can chat again sometime down the road. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah there's a, they, they keep making movies, I hear. So, yeah. <laughs> and, for sure. Uh, so what's, 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 the, what's, what's the ones on my – I mean, I, you know, I said trans, Transformers, uh, I don't know, Batman, The Dark Knight. Uh, mm, I haven't what seen you, that one. What do you think? What do you think about Watchmen? What do you think about Iron Man? What do you think about Mr. and Mrs. Smith, etc. Et and there's and there, Hancock. Hancock. Yeah, check out Hancock. It's it, it's kind of unbelievable how blatant it is about that particular black man, white woman cultural law enforcement. So. Dang. I I will be watching films. I will be watching films and reading books. I'm going to check out those books yeah. uh, immediately. I'm real thankful about. I'm always appreciative when white people suggest uh, good books. When anyone, but particularly, particularly admitted white supremacists, when they tell me books to read, I try to check them out because um, they tend to have the best information about the system of racism, white supremacy. But uh, yeah, I will definitely uh, look forward if we chat again down the road for sure. And I hope. Uh, all the non-white people listening to the show, get color monitors, read it closely, take notes, and uh, go out and watch some of the films that he talks about uh, in the book. Uh, thank you a ton, Dr. Kevorkian. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Gus T. Renegade. <laughs> right on. Uh, I will talk to you soon, sir. All right. Take care. Mm-hmm. Bye. All right on. Um, I want to thank... Uh, all of our listeners for tuning in to the show. Akima, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. All oh, right, on. Did you uh, what? Did you have any thoughts on uh, today's program? Um, no, not right now. Um, but I forgot what her name was. Uh, Diva, DJ Diva. Diva JC. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, if she's listening, I would love for her, um, on her show to talk about um black women being mistreated within music under the system of white supremacy. I would love mm. to hear her, th- her thoughts on that. If she ever does a show about it on her show. Mm. I believe she might still be on the line. Uh, if you give me a moment, I can check to see if she uh, would be willing to do a show on that. I don't know why she would be in opposition to it, but if you give me a hot say, if you can plug your blog, uh, I will uh, see if I can get her on the line. Uh, yes, uh, my blog is uh, Frisky Kimi uh, Counter Racism Scratch Post, and I just talk about white supremacy and racism and my cat 
also. Hello? Hello? Hi. This is Hi. DJ C. Hi. Um, this is Hakima. Um, uh, okay. Um, we always talk about that subject on my show, Music Woman, okay. because not only are women marginalized, but black women are really marginalized. Yeah. Uh, you know, right now, the, the uh, queens of jazz are white women, you know, who have no understanding of what jazz and blues music really is, and that's why my book, uh, it took me 15 years to finally publish my book, A History of African American Jazz and Blues. Okay. And see, I contend that the blues came from the tears of black women. Mm-hmm. You know, and I tell you what, you know, I know Gus has both of our emails. Let me, I don't want you to give it to me online, but uh, it would be wonderful if we could be in touch with each other, you know, and talk. Oh, yeah. I- I will I will keep in contact with you, yeah. And my show, now this week, you know, as a matter of fact, this whole month, I am featuring um, four white women. But last month, I had black women. It's not that I look for white women or, or that the women that come to me, they get booked, okay. But it is specifically, the show is specifically for women in jazz and blues because these are the women that their music doesn't get played, you know. So I would love to do a show with you, and we could just talk about it. Okay. Okay. You know, so Google me, Diva JC, mm-hmm. and uh, I'll give you one of my emails. is musicwoman08 at yahoo.com, and you can send me an email there. I don't give my regular email out, and I'll, you know, I'll give you that when we talk. And we can, you know, format a show specifically for the, because I've written a book called Amazing Music Women about 40 women, and most of them are black women who, I mean, they, they were dead by the time they were 30, 40 years old. So they never really reap the benefits of all the great music that they brought to American society. Okay. Okay, tell me your name again. What was that, ma'am? Your name again. My my name? Mm-hmm. Hakima. Okay. All right. So Google me, Diva JC, and then let, get, send me an email and we'll continue to talk. And Gus, when you get a chance, send me a message, and I'll call you too. Oh, right on. We'll do. We'll do. Yeah. I will uh, hit you up uh, probably today, um, sometime after I uh, get offline and have a moment to uh, calm myself after the show. I will shoot your email. Okay. And chat it up. Also, I think you should have a show on victims of white white uh, supremacy in the music business because I would have to say, hmm. Who me? I'm the Gus. I'm yeah, I I think that this would be fodder for a, a good show for you because, I mean, I'm reading Mary Lou Williams' book right now. She's a pianist, and uh, she belonged to TOBA, which was an organization of black actors and actresses and musicians back in the 20s. And these people were treated like, I mean, like, they were treated like cattle. They hardly got paid. You know, they, they lived in really bad circumstances, but they were, they were musicians. And there's a lot of information out there about how the originators of jazz and blues were treated. You know, even by, the, by black Christians, the way that they were treated, you know. So this is a very deep subject, but it was, it's actually the music of African Americans that has maintain their survival in this country, the music. So, you know, let me know when you're ready to discuss this because I'm ready. <laughs> For sure. I mean, and it's, it's all areas of people activity, so I, I definitely feel like 
uh, music and entertainment is is definitely an area where non-white people have and continue uh, to be thoroughly abused uh, by white people who I suspect are practicing uh, racism. So, yeah, let me uh, dig in. I like to uh, to make sure I'm informed enough that I can at least, you know, pretend to hold intelligent conversation with the people that I have on the show. So uh, let me uh, see what I can do to, uh, you know, do a little research. Well, you need to read my book, <laughs> okay. A History of African American Jazz and Blues. That's what needs to happen. So, you know, we'll talk, and then we'll get to that, okay? For sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. And if uh, Hakima and you two get together to do the show uh, together, then I will definitely make sure I participate in that, and uh, we'll plug that as well so that folks can go check that out. I definitely will be in the audience to uh, listen in when you all uh, can coordinate and make that happen for sure. Um, okay. So, yeah, That's good. Yeah, future work future work for non-white people being productive in uh, discussing racism, white supremacy, and uh, what we can do to replace the system of white supremacy with a system of justice. I wanted to take time to uh, let the listeners know, um, Gus T. Renegade, uh, true to my name, I do not have a set date for my program at this point, and I probably won't have a set date uh, for a while. I guess at some point I might lock a day down, but I kind of enjoy having the freedom to schedule a program whenever uh, I have free time or whenever uh, a guest is, is willing to uh, make things happen. Uh, so it's good uh, if you think the show is constructive. Uh, if you are a registered member at Blog Talk Radio, favorite the show. That is uh, helpful for me, helps me uh, get features and things of that nature. If you could favorite the show, and that way you will know when I schedule a show. You'll uh, see it in your little window for favorite hosts, so you'll know when programs are coming up, the date and time, so you'll be in the loop. If you are not a registered member at Blog Talk Radio, you can subscribe uh, to the Cows Radio Show. Uh, There's a link Uh, that's in the description for all my shows. All you have to do is click that link, put your email address in, and you'll get an email update whenever I schedule a show so you will be informed. Uh, You can also uh, go to thecode.net. They have uh, information. I tend to post there when I have a show. I also post at uh, blacktalkradio.net. I post there. If you look in the events, you'll see when I have programs. Uh, You can Twitter me. Twitter is on my blog talk site, so there are lots of ways to stay informed. Uh, I say that because uh, just over the past week, I have seen where I've got a little more access 